Welcome to a meeting of your Hillsborough County Board of County Commissioners. Representing District 1, Harry Cohen. Representing District 2, Ken Hagen. Representing District 3, Gwen Myers. Representing District 4, Stacy White. Representing District 5, Mariella Smith. Representing District 6, Pat Kemp. Representing District 7, Kimberly Overman. The County Administrator is Bonnie Wise. The County Attorney is Christine Beck. Time is set aside at the beginning of each meeting for citizens to speak on any issue, so we have time for everyone. Speakers are asked to limit their comments to three minutes. Today's meeting is brought to you with closed captioning by Hillsboro Television. Good morning. Welcome to the Board of County Commission. Am I getting an echo? Yeah, okay. Good morning. Welcome to the Board of County Commission uh, meeting on July 20, uh, 2022. And with that, I'll call the meeting to order. And uh, let's go ahead and do a roll call before we get started. I believe one of our members is actually v attending virtually. Overman? Here. Cohen? Here. Hagan? Here. Kemp? Here. Myers? Here. Smith? Here. White? Here. <laughs> and Commissioner White is here. <laughs> Thank you. You have a quorum. Excellent. So we are all present and accounted for, although maybe not physically in the same space, which is totally fine. Uh, with that, I'll ask our chaplain to open the, uh, with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll ask that everyone please stand at this time for the pledge and invocation, and we'll begin with the pledge. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will guide this board, our staff, and stakeholders as we make important decisions for this county this morning. Father, I also ask for uh, uh, blessings today for our uh, board chair as she uh, celebrates another trip around the sun. And uh, as always, I pray for uh, our first responders and members of our armed forces and pray that you will uh, comfort them and guide them and keep them safe each and every day. I ask for these blessings in your heavenly name. Amen. Thank you. And thank you very much. Every day is a gift. <laughs> um, with that, I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge that we have a ceremony today proclaiming Americans with Disability Act Anniversary uh, Awareness Day. And with that, um, we are uh, going to recognize uh, Commissioner Smith, I believe she's, is she doing that in the media room? Okay, excellent. Commissioner Smith, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is uh, Sharon Austin, co-chair of the Hillsborough County Alliance for People with Disabilities with us on the call today? Yes, ma'am, I am. Good morning. And we would also like to welcome the following individuals who are joining us, some of us, some of them here in person with us and some of them virtually today. We have Mr. Bart Bonbrest, co-chair of the Hillsborough County of the Hillsborough County Alliance for People with Disabilities, Mr. Ben Ritter, chair of the Tampa Mayor's Alliance for Persons with Disabilities, and his wife, Alder Allensworth. Uh, Janet Beyer, City of Tampa Alliance for People with Disabilities, Denise Barnes, USF Card Program, Raquel Pancho, City of Tampa ADA Coordinator, uh, Patty Sanchez, uh, Manager of Employment Services for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing at McDonald Training Center, uh, David Davenport, Rehabilitation Services at Baycare, and his wife, Jean Ann Davenport, welcome. Brenda Clark, City of Tampa Alliance for People with Disabilities, Sandra Shroka uh, with Arts for All Florida, 
and Justin Stark, uh, Director of the Florida Spinal Cord Injury Research Center, Cheryl Brown, Director for Lighthouse for the Blind and Low Vision, Chrissy Clemente, ADA Coordinator for Plant City, and Melinda Wheatley and Elizabeth Mueller, founding members of the Hillsborough County Alliance for People with Disabilities, and Hillsborough County ADA Coordinator Carmen Labou. Thank you all for being here with us today. We are celebrating the 32nd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. You know, that seems 32 years is kind of a long time, but it's also not that long of a time. Um, and we've accomplished a lot in that time. I am especially happy about this because my family and I have a long history of involvement with the disabled community, in particular with accessible sports. For years before I became a commissioner, I participated in accessible sporting events around the world, but also right here in Hillsborough County, where I got to work with some of the very finest people who are completely dedicated to the spirit of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm very proud to say from my own personal experience that the people in the organizations whose leaders we have with us today, as well as the people in our Hillsborough County Parks Department and throughout our organization are all people who work passionately to enable everyone to participate equally in our county activities. This 32nd anniversary of the ADA is a very important day for us as Hillsborough County reinforces its commitment to continue to provide quality services, programs, and activities for people with disabilities. And I'll name just a few of the resources that we offer in this county. Recreational programs at the Leslie Les Miller Jr. All People's Community Park and Life Center which is a showcase facility for therapeutic programs since it opened in 2007. Paralympic Sports Tampa Bay provides year-round opportunities for athletes to compete. Our Bacchus Equestrian Center features innovative equine therapy for children and adults with disabilities. Our Camp Sparks program is designed for youth with disabilities, allowing them to connect with their peers. And the Sunshine Line offers door-to-door -door transportation services for people with disabilities. And we have special needs shelters provided during hurricane season. The shelters welcome service animals to be with their handlers. And in fact, now is the time to pre-register for disaster assistance for people with disabilities if you have not already done so. Our county commission's recognition of this anniversary of the ADA represents the strong commitment of everyone in our county administration and staff to helping all our residents to thrive and prosper in our community. It is my pleasure to present this proclamation which celebrates July 26, 2022 as Americans with Disabilities Act 32nd Anniversary Awareness Day. So now I'll read the proclamation and it will appear on the screen as I read it. Whereas July 26, 2022 marks the 20, 32nd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, landmark legislation that was passed to ensure people with disabilities have the same civil rights and opportunities as those who don't have disabilities. And whereas the principles of the act foster equality and inclusion for all people with disabilities by reducing barriers, changing perceptions, and increasing full participation in community life. And whereas the law prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life including jobs, schools, transportation, and all private and then public places that are open to the community. And 
Whereas the American with Disabilities Act mandates reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities, providing that everyone has full access to services, resources, and facilities. And whereas the Hillsborough County Alliance for Citizens with Disabilities enhances local compliance with the Americans with Disability Act, raises awareness about the equity of people, and advocates on behalf of people with disabilities. And whereas the 32nd anniversary of the passage of the Americans with Disability Act is celebrated with the theme, celebrating the ADA, 32 years of accessibility and inclusion, which recognizes the importance of ensuring opportunities for the full inclusion and participation of residents with disabilities throughout the community. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Hillsborough County, Florida, does hereby declare July 26, uh, uh, July 26, 2022, as Americans with Disability Act 32nd Anniversary Awareness Day in Hillsborough County and urges all residents and visitors to celebrate the 32nd anniversary of the passage of the law by reaffirming their commitment to its principles and by supporting equality and inclusion for people with disabilities. Awarded this tw 20th day of July, 2022. So, Ms. Austin, uh, would you like to say a few words? Only on behalf of all of us at the Alliance, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you all for being here with us today. We'll take a few photos with our in-person participants and uh, gather here for the um, photographer. Is there uh, any, anyone, uh, Commissioner Overman, in the boardroom? Well, if I don't see any at the moment, but I do want to thank everyone that actually works on behalf of uh, those with disabilities uh, and abilities. Um, I have a family member with a disability and I know how challenging it can be. I've hired individuals in my past life as a uh, business owner uh, that gave a shot for a woman who really wanted to go back to work and, and, mm -hmm. and take care of herself and her family after experiencing a, an accident that caused a disability. And it is so important that we fight for access to a good life that everyone in this country and this county deserves. So thank you so much for your work. And with that, I'll let you guys do the photos and wanna thank you, Commissioner Smith, for bringing this and wanna thank all the recipients for joining us today to help make Hillsborough County the best county in Hillsborough County. With that, I'll recognize Commissioner Kemp. Thank you. And I just wanted to thank all of you. I'm familiar with many of, uh, many of you out there for your activism uh, on behalf of this community and how much change you've made. And also, Commissioner Smith, over the years, I know uh, of your, your work and your dedication. So thank you to, uh, to everyone, uh, everyone there for the difference they've made in Hillsborough County and um, what the change that they've brought. Thank you, Commissioner Kemp. And with that, they're, they're taking some photos. Thank you. So. Excellent, excellent. And while they're doing that, I'm going to recognize our county administrator, Ms. Bonnie Wise, to approve the changes to the agenda. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and happy birthday. Thank you. We have uh, several items for time certain. The first public hearing, item D1, is a public hearing to accept comments on that draft analysis of, of impediments to fair housing choice for plan year 2022 to 2025. Item D2 is a public hearing to accept comments on their proposed plan year 2022 annual action plan and substantial amendments to plan years 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 annual action plans. Item D3 is to conduct a public hearing to consider enacting an ordinance enabling the county to impose and collect an annual non ad valorem special assessment levied solely on property owned or leased by hospitals to fund the hospital direct payment program. 
Item D4 is a public hearing to consider an amendment to the ordinance regulating the use of fertilizers containing nitrogen and or phosphorus within unincorporated Hillsborough County. Item D5 is a public hearing concerning the Bloomingdale Special Dependent District. Item D6 is a public hearing to consider changing the terms of service rendered for the solid waste non ad valorem collection and disposal assessment from calendar year to a fiscal year to eliminate the Hillsborough County deferred revenue requirement. Item D9 is to conduct a public hearing and adopt the resolution which establishes the solid waste non ad valorem disposal and collection assessment rates, other user fees and charges, and the solid waste disposal and collection rolls for fiscal year 2023. There is no proposed change to the non ad valorem assessment amount for residential customers. Item D7 is to conduct a public hearing to establish separate uniform rates for the various street lighting classifications for fiscal year, for, sorry, for the 2022 tax year and adopt the non ad valorem assessment for street lighting for the 2022 tax year. Item D8 is a public hearing to and adopt a resolution that establishes the stormwater management non ad valorem assessment rates and non ad valorem assessment role for calendar year 2022 and sets the maximum allowable assessment rates for future years for properties added to the assessment role this year. Item C1 at 11 o'clock is the delivery of the county administrator's fiscal year 23 recommended budget. Item E1 at 11.30 is a special appearance by Bob Enriquez, Hillsborough County property appraiser, to present the current state of the real estate market in Hillsborough County. 11.45 is a recess for lunch. At 1.30 is item B1, is to accept the County Internal Auditor's Office external quality assessment report performed by the Institute of Internal Auditors Quality Services. Those are the changes to the agenda. Move approval. We have a second motion to approve the changes by Commissioner Kemp, a second by Commissioner Myers. Please take a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? I believe she's on her way back upstairs, so she may not be available. But. White? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we're at the point where we have an opportunity for the public to participate in our board meeting process. And as um, you heard in the changes in the agenda, or many of the items in the agenda, we have uh, lots and lots on the agenda today. Uh, we also have several public hearings. So for those that are here to speak on the public hearings, when we open the um, when we close, uh, the, when we open the public hearing, you'll have an opportunity to speak on that particular item. But as um, for those that are here to speak on general items, uh, we'll be able to call you by name. So we welcome comments by our citizens on any issue, and your opinions are valued in terms of providing input to the board members. It is requested at the same time that you address the board that comments are not directed personally against a commissioner or a staff member, but rather at the issues. This provides a mutual respect between the board and the members of the public. We've set aside 45 minutes period um, immediately following the changes for public comment. And at the discretion of the chair, the board may again hear public comments at the end of the meeting. And this is again, not the public hearing comments, but the overall general comments. At the discretion, um, anyone who wishes to speak virtually or in person may do so by completing the online public form. The forum is open to the public uh, for sign up 48 hours prior to the start of the meeting and an option is available to notify whether comments will be provided virtually or in person at the meeting. Additionally, in person speakers, <coughs> excuse me, will be able to sign up uh, on site at the kiosk or by a smartphone on the day of the meeting. For participants who wish to speak virtually who have completed the online forum, an audio call in number will be provided after the forum is received by the county. All speakers will be required to provide their name, email address, and the telephone number on the online form. This information is being requested to facilitate the public comment process. And the public comment period ends, I mean, the sign up ends at 9 a.m. on the day of the meeting. 
I'll call on the speakers by name in the order of which their requests to speak have been received for the public period, um, separate from the public hearings. Prioritization is, is on a first come, first serve basis. The boardroom and the multipurpose room are designated for speakers only. Those who come to the county center to watch the meeting and not speak will be accommodated in the lobby area. Um, face coverings are strongly encouraged in the boardroom, although not required. The CDC guidance strongly recommends that unvaccinated people and those that with weakened immune systems continue to wear masks. And the multipurpose room will be available for those residents who signed up to speak after the thir first 35 have been uh, registered. All virtual speakers will be muted upon joining the meeting and will be unmuted after being recognized by the chair by name. Up to three minutes are provided for each speaker. The first speaker that we have signed up to speak on, a, on the general basis is uh, Mr. Thomas Foley, who is in person. Mr. Foley, you're recognized. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I am Thomas Foley, a longtime resident of Hillsborough County since 1982. Uh, I am here to speak on first item A17. It's a historic preservation challenge grant review committee recommendations from June 10th, 2022. Uh, the Florida State Constitution, Article 1, Section 3, states that no revenue of the state or any political subdivision or agency thereof shall ever be taken from the public treasury directly or indirectly in the aid of any church, sect, or religious denomination, or in aid of any sectarian institution. Buried on the second page in the background of the Economic Development Department's agenda item, there is a recommended award from the Historic Preservation Challenge Grant to the First Presbyterian Church of Plant City. It's a first time applicant located at 404 West Reynolds Street in Plant City. This is not a public building. It's a $941,000 complex occupying half a city block in Plant City. It is neither appropriate nor good public policy for the county to spend taxpayer dollars to repair a church. The building is regularly used for religious worship and continues to be used by an active congregation. Using taxpayer funds to perpetuate religious worship is unconstitutional. Supporting a church now leads to calls for other churches to ask for the county to support their renovations, such as the Church of Scientology occupying Centro Ybor. The message this agenda communicates to its citizens is that churches will be rewarded if they neglect their duties as landowners of historic buildings. The current practice also exposes the county ta taxpayers to liability and jeopardizes taxpayer money. The money could be used for more appropriate secular purposes and the board should stop rewarding churches for neglect and help those who really need it. If you truly believe that it's the best policy to use taxpayer funds to, report, uh, to repair historic churches, then those churches should sign off over the building and the property to Hillsborough County, free and clear, so that we can maintain it. In fact, this $941,000 complex is exempt from property taxes, from school taxes, and from your stormwater non-assessment tax, a fee, excuse me. I recommend that the county commissioners pull this agenda item and remove the religious institution funding. Thank you for your time, sir. Your time Thank has you. expired. Thank you. The next speaker that signed up to speak is attending virtually, Ms. Sharon Calvert. You're recognized. Uh, Madam Chair, both Sharon Calvert and Cynthia Schiff have not signed it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. The next speaker signed up to speak is Cynthia Chip, who's also attending virtually. Uh, Madam Chair, Cynthia Chip has not signed it as well. Okay. I have a couple of other off the agenda items that uh, individuals have spoken up um, or signed up to speak. The next one is Gabriel Mira. 
Is Gabriel, Mr. Mira? Ms. Is... Hi there, thank you for your time. I, um... Hi, this is Gabriel Mira. Um, yeah, thank you for your time. I wanted to uh, just to talk to you about D7, the streetlight assessment, and then um, I didn't hear, I didn't catch uh, the, um, the assessment, but the proposed solid waste collection and disposal assessment as well. So I just wanted to address both of those. Uh, I've been living in, uh, born and raised in Hillsborough County, and Mr. Um, Mira? now finally Mr. A, Mira? a current resident. Uh, or, yeah. Mr. Mira, yes, both of those are public hearings, which you'll have time to speak at those two items. Um, and you'll be able to speak on both of those items individually if you'd like to wait till those times to offer your public comment and be able to speak on both items rather than the three minutes you have now. It, I mean, it's up to you. Okay, if, sure, I know that's true. No, I can wait. The street lighting assessment, is that, that's D7. What was the solid waste collection? Solid waste D, is which hearing is really that? Is that D five nine? Okay, so you need D seven and D nine. Um, so when we get to those points, I will add your name to that so that I can call on your name at that at those public hearings. Is that okay with you? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much for participating. Okay, the next person that signed up to speak um, on uh, general items is Russ Janus. Um, I'm hoping I didn't mispronounce that. Is he available? Communications, is he available? I believe Russ signed um, up. It shows that. He's in person? Uh, He's not here. Yes, I believe that's what we have on our list. Okay, all right. With that, we will move and close public hearing and uh, go to the next item. Uh, thank you. Since we still have time before 10 o'clock, <laughs> items. Oh, yes, consent items. Oh, cons oh I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. With that, um, we need to consider um, a motion to approve the consent items. Uh, as per the public speaker, um, I'd like to, who asked about the church and the historic funding, I'd like to ask our um, county attorney for any uh, comments on, with regards to that. Ms. Beck, you're recognized. <laughs> they moved my microphone, so I'm confused. Um, yes, the, uh, what, what might be a workable solution here is that this item, A17, is simply approving the funding for all of the awards, but all of the agreements for each of the individual awardees have to come back to the board for approval, which is routinely done, so that would allow us time to review with staff all of the issues raised and be able to fully brief the board before you approve the agreement. So we would have an option, I guess, of either approving the consent agenda as stated this morning or else still pulling A17 and, and doing it um, later, deferring it and having this reviewed. We have yes. both of those options. I, I think technically those are both options to pull it now or to simply approve it, to approve the funding in place, and then we would be able to address the concerns when the agreements come back. It's your choice. Um, uh, Commissioner uh, Kemp, what would you like to do? Uh, I'll, I'll listen to. I would leave it because that way we, it won't affect the others, and we, we can deal with this one individually when the time comes. But thank you for bringing that up. That was great. I'm amenable to. Sorry. <laughs> Com thank you, Commissioner White. You're recognized. Thank you, and I'm in favor of, of moving this forward this morning as well. Obviously, the county attorney's office is gonna have to do their legal analysis, but I just wanna state for the record right now that I'm of the belief that houses of worship um, are oftentimes um, beautiful works of architecture, and, and I can see uh, a difference between preserving uh, that architectural treasure versus supporting 
uh, the operations or functions of a church that, or any any religious congregation that that may be held within that building. So that's my policy position. Obviously, the county attorney's office has to get there in terms of a legal analysis, but I'd like to see it move forward this morning. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So I'd like to move approval of the consent agenda. Okay, Commissioner Kemp has offered a motion to approve. We have a second by Commissioner Cohen. Please take a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagen? Yes. Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent, thank you very much. Ms. Wise. Thank you. Now, since we have time before the uh, first public hearing, we can move to the regular agenda. Uh, the first item is item B2. Um, this is to approve a plan to repair existing sidewalks in various locations from the county. As you recall, this was funded with the American Rescue Plan dollars in the amount of $20 million. And Josh Bellotti with Engineering and Operations will present this item. Good morning, commissioners. Josh Bellotti, Engineering and Operations Department. Uh, at the May 4th meeting, you approved funding of $20 million in American Rescue Plan funds to go towards repairs of existing sidewalks across the county and directed staff to bring back a project scope within 90 days. $15 million of that total was to be allocated to underserved areas. Uh, as we've shared with you before in our briefing, Hillsborough County has over 3,200 miles of existing sidewalks, which could take you on a walk from here to Seattle. And our list of, uh, not, uh, sorry, our list of identified repair needs uh, based on years of customer service requests is substantial. When we receive customer service requests for sidewalk repairs, our crews inspect neighborhoods and perform minor repairs where possible but those areas that need to be replaced get marked and added to our list awaiting funding for capital repairs. And in the underserved areas across the county, which are defined in the county's community equity profile and the TPO's non-discrimination and equity plan, that list of sidewalk repairs totals over $26 million. And so the $15 million of ARP funds being directed at those projects in underserved areas is significant while reminding us that there is still much more to do. But for today, the good news is that this project will go a long way towards making our existing sidewalks across the county safer, and we're pleased to bring this item for your approval. So I'll stop there and offer to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for that presentation. I don't see anybody in the queue, but I did want to say how pleased I am that we took a step back and really looked at making sure we were serving underserved communities with these dollars, and I wanna thank you, staff for taking that lens when looking at those issues to make sure that we're addressing public funding in an equitable manner. So um, it's a good good step forward and a good example of the good work that's been done. With that, I'll recognize Commissioner Cohen. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to make two brief comments. The first uh, is to really thank the staff for all the outreach that they did to us as they prepared these lists. Uh, and, and really went through the details of the different projects that they're gonna be working on. I think it was really helpful and it, very illuminating as to how expensive it is to do this work. Uh, and then the, the second thing um, was just to say that you know it is a drop in the bucket in terms of the safety needs in this county and people should not uh, be fooled into, or not fooled, but should not believe that if we're spending $20 million, that's somehow going to make a meaningful difference across this enormous county that literally um, has one and a half billion dollars worth of work to do to bring us up to snuff uh, and to, to get things where they need to be. But it is a, help and it will be good and um, I'm happy to support it. Thank you, Commissioner Cohen. Commissioner Kemp, you're And right. I guess, was that a motion to move approval? <laughs> okay, I'll second it then. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> um, and um, I'd also like to say I'm really pleased with the job that the staff did on this. I think it's really important, in fact, even pointing out the fact that we had, I think, two and a half million dollars in claims um, for uh, uh, people who had had accidents uh, on our sidewalks. It, um, it is so important that we work on this and, and not um, minimize the impacts and importance in our community and countywide. But I'd also like to say that I was really, really pleased to see that the staff and, and 
I did not know. Kind of um, saw this in terms of an equity lens and overlaid um, a look at our different um, communities uh, that are uh, underserved communities and um, in most in need, and did that with a, I think it was a 20% or more dedication of the funds to uh, those areas in particular. And I was very impressed by that and uh, very pleased and it gave me a lot of assurance as we move uh, forward on this. So I'm, I'm really, really pleased with the uh, job that um, staff did and I'm really um, pleased to support this. Excellent, thank you very much. So we have a motion by Commissioner Cohen, a second by Commissioner Kemp. I'm not seeing any other further comments. Please take a roll call vote. Alderman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent, thank you very much. Ms. Wise. And thank you all for those comments and the big thanks to you, Josh Bellotti and John Lyons and Greg Horadell for shepherding that through. Excellent job. Thank here. you. The next item is item B3. This is an item regarding the Cannon Street and Oak Preserve Boulevard. Um, this item had come before you uh, before, and you had suggested that we make certain changes to this agenda item. John Muller and Adam Gormley are here to go through that, and they will discuss um, this item as well as the changes that you all had requested. Thank you. Mr. Muller, you're recognized. Good morning, commissioners. John Muller, Director of Facilities Management and Real Estate Services. As Ms. Weiss mentioned, Adam Gormley, Director of Development Services, is also present virtually for this item. I also have real estate available for assistance with questions. Agenda item B3 is requesting your approval to adopt a resolution to declare the 61.88 acre county owned parcel at the corner of Kinnon Street and Oak Preserve Boulevard as surplus and conduct an offering for bids. We did submit a slight correction to this item in the background. There is a reference to the Kinnon South parcel, which was acquired concurrently with the Kinnon North parcel we are requesting to surplus. The acreage was incorrectly indicated as 5.43 acres. The correction reflects that the Kinnon South is actually 14.9 acres. This item was originally presented to the board at the June 2nd uh, BOCC meeting of this year. Uh, HTV, can you please put, a, put up my slide? As a reminder, the subject property is shown on the screen for you. It is located in the unincorporated area of the county near New Tampa and is adjacent to the Pasco County line. Please remove the slide. The following revisions have been made to this agenda item. There is no request to use a brokerage service. County real estate staff will market and offer the property. There is no longer a request that should offers come in below appraised values that staff be authorized to reestablish the minimum bid price. In the case of no acceptable bids, staff will review and make further recommendations to the board. We have also clarified that this is an offering and that any recommended sale will be brought back to the board for approval. With regards to any future sale, we are still recommending in this item that the proceeds of the sale be designated to the Parks and Recreation CIP program for the Cross Creek branch and improvements. To that end, we provided some additional language on this recommendation in the background. Lastly, the motion includes the language of the review request at the June 2nd BOCC meeting that development services review the parcel with 143 dwellings approved to determine if it provides for the same protections to impacts as would be if approved today. Adam Gormley is here to speak to that review. Adam. Thank you, John. Good morning, commissioners. Adam Gormley, Development Services Department. Uh, yes, we did do a review of uh, the uh, zoning on this parcel, which is RZ070533. Uh, we looked at it both from the land use entitlement standpoint, transportation and natural resources. Uh, short version is we did find that it, it provided for the protections that we would be seeking today. Uh, their their um, uh, density for the project is in accordance with the uh, uh, NMU3 uh, comp land classification that, that's applicable to the property uh, as it relates to the Live Oak PD from which this 
parcel was removed. Uh, we looked at that that uh, rezoning as well and found that with the with the removal of this parcel, uh, live oak still remained uh, well below the the maximum density that the comp comprehensive plan uh, would allow to be considered. Uh, from the natural resources side, uh, we looked at the uh, extent of significant wildlife habitat around the, the project today and compare that to the area that's approved for development and uh, find that we would still uh, recommend the same area for development as it, as it is outside of the uh, um, significant wildlife habitat portion of the project. From the transportation standpoint, uh, there's a little difference in the timing of where some reviews uh, are done. Uh, typically today, we have uh, traffic analysis submitted at the time of zoning to address uh, site access uh, improvements and, 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 and what improvements might be needed to accommodate the project's traffic. Uh, this, this PD uh, does have that as a requirement at the site plan stage. It requires that a traffic analysis be submitted to look at um, uh, the operational improvements needed at the, uh, both at the project entrances uh, and also at impacted intersections. Uh, so basically with that, uh, we, we, we found that there was no um, uh, protections that we would be seeking today that, that aren't uh, pro provided for in, in this rezoning. And I will also note that this, this rezoning does have some, uh, some fairly detailed uh, conditions uh, regarding um, the volume and, and timing of stormwater discharge to protect the Hillsborough River and, and surrounding wetlands. Um, so with that, we, we did find that the um, uh, zoning provides for the same level of protection that we would uh, be seeking to have today. I'm available for any questions. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, with that, I am going to recognize Commissioner Hagan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we discussed this um, at length back, I believe, at our June 2nd board meeting. I just want to thank staff for the, uh, their hard work that they put into uh, addressing some of the concerns from board members during that meeting and uh, move approval. We have a motion second. by Commissioner Haken, a second by Commissioner White. Commissioner Smith, you're recognized. Thank you. And um, uh, also want to thank staff for uh, listening to the board. I think. Um, well, I'm really glad we took a closer look at this and, and uh, resolved some of the issues that were raised by board members. I think it is also a, an opportunity for, um, you know, maybe some um, uh, understanding moving forward in the future. I'm really glad that we're saving an awful lot of money by brokering this deal in-house. And... Um, uh, you know, hoping that uh, in future surplusing that can really be considered as it was here. Um, I'm also glad, very glad that we had development services review um, the zoning on our county owned property before we just sell it to somebody with some really old uh, zoning with it. And I think that that should be uh, standard practice when I, uh, when we are um, surplusing property. I don't um, I don't know if uh, after we uh, dispense with this, if you think that would take a motion or if. Uh, and I'll ask uh, the county administrator um, if I need to make uh, some board direction that that these things be uh, part of future surplusing. Um, consideration or I guess I probably should. So maybe Madam Chair, after this uh, motion on the floor is dispensed with, if, if I could make that motion to uh, make that a, a, a board policy or um, a staff direction. Um, but thanks again for, for going through this. I think uh, we have made it better and uh, certainly eased my mind about the zoning that is traveling along with this, especially since it was so old, uh, the, in, uh, the zoning was so old. So it was uh, important to review that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. I, I agree. There are some opportunities to have the county actually revisit the comp plan or the zoning for any property that we move forward actually within the Florida statute. So it would seem appropriate that we can take advantage of that. Uh, Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. 
Yes, and I'm also um, pleased that the brokering was uh, reconsidered, and um, and I hope that's part of a motion. It sounded like it would be for the future, um, and I think we kind of discussed that before, but that on any a property like this, and I understand the reasons it was looked at um, putting it out there, but it certainly will save us a few hundred thousand uh, to not have it uh, done outside, instead to have it done inside, which was perfectly, we were perfectly capable of. I didn't know if there was a problem with that. Um, also, I'm glad to have had that. I really think there are a lot of elements of this, like the ones that Commissioner Smith raised about the zoning and just turning over uh, what we had, so I feel uh, reassured about that. It's also, this property is also in that pocket up there by Pebble Creek, which the city annexed around it in, uh, in um, a pattern that left that on the border of Pasco County by itself, and, and we've had issues up there uh, with our um, fire service because we don't have a station within uh, any uh, reasonable distance, and it's been an ongoing issue, but I, I think we have, <laughs> we had it pulled for a while. We had Pasco County that we were having service it, but now the city of Tampa is back to servicing that, so I feel uh, better about that. The, also, the water and wastewater for that area, because while it is unincorporated county, it is served by the city of Tampa, um, because of, uh, again, the, the pocket up there that's not been annexed um, by, the, by the city. Um, and so that service uh, I wanted to look into and understand as well um, with regards to um, that piece of property. So I just want to um, point out those, those uh, issues with it. Okay, excellent. And Thank you. I also want to make sure that <laughs> that we don't wait 15 years to rezone Kennan South, <laughs> um, like we have left that zoning on there for 15 years, and and uh, do the uh, quasi uh, public quasi uh, rezoning on that property um, so that this uh, doesn't linger. I have the uh, sense that it won't, but I just like to put that on the record. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Hagan, your hand is still up. Are you wanting to comment again? Okay, great. Um, I, I want to say, you know, basically I am total of support of this process because we, we have had a policy where any surplus property goes towards consideration for affordable housing and given the location of this, that was compromised. Given the, the purpose of buying it in the first place and having it go back for capital improvements for parks and recs and other entities is also an important process. Um, but also recognizing it doesn't preclude it from workforce housing if that were to be a goal, whether that be for our military families or for other families in that area once housing. Um, and infrastructure can be made available. So with that, um, we have a motion and a second. And with that, we'll do a roll call vote, please. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Thank you very much. Miss. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Smith, you're recognized. Thank you. And so at this point, I'd like to, um, well, first of all, maybe ask the county attorney. I'm, what I'm wanting to do is make a motion that is, uh, provides some direction uh, to staff to handle future surplusing the way that we did in this case, in those, especially two regards. So I'm wondering if that needs a board policy or what? what? What I would suggest is to make your motion with the direction and then following the board vote, um, the staff can determine whether it's better to bring back a board policy or simply incorporate that in the administrative directive that they will have to follow based on your guidance. And we'll have some flexibility that way to determine what's best. Great, thank you. So um, I'd like to make a motion then at this point that essentially we handle future surplusing of county property in much the same way that we did here, especially in these two regards. Um, one that uh, 
staff um, does a thorough review of any entitlements on the property from zoning to uh, comp plan designation and make sure that it is uh, consistent with um, zoning uh, there the, that they would recommend uh, in the in the current day uh, with regards to uh, everything, including of course transportation and natural resources and uh, 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 stormwater, coastal high hazard, all the usual things that they review, and as well as and maybe uh, Commissioner Kemp might, uh, if you feel like I'm not wording this correctly, uh, let me know, but. Uh, also to uh, prioritize and first consider uh, brokering the sale in-house with our own real estate uh, staff uh, before considering uh, what, uh, any need to, uh, in a specific case, to bring in uh, outside uh, brokerage at an additional expense. So, uh, and that motion would be for staff to consider whether it needs to be a, a it, it can be incorporated as a staff direction or needs to be brought back as a board policy. Second. So we have a motion by Commissioner Smith and a second by Commissioner Kemp. Um, I'd like to make reference to the item that is to be brought back to the board um, that I brought to the attention of the staff to bring back a report regarding um, properties and potential housing and workforce as it is prioritized. So I think we can probably address that with that item that's due to come back in September. So that might, if we can tie it to that particular item. Um, it makes mention of um, potentially looking at properties that might not work for affordable housing, but does work for workforce housing in consideration, um, which would impact the, the land use in the code. So I think I think we can tie that in with it if at all possible. But it doesn't have to be. But I think if, if it can be accommodated, we can actually accelerate that item. Miss um, Wise, you have look like you have a question or a comment. <laughs> yeah, we are working on that particular item that you mentioned. That was the future issue item that was on our tracking system. And then regarding this, there I think there's a number of ways. Um, staff is already texting me. We can incorporate it into our policies. And so we'll, we'll determine the best way to handle that. So just to assure you that we will work on both of the items. Excellent. Thank you very items. much. Um, I'm not... Commissioner Cohen. Yeah, I just had a quick comment. Um, I'm going to support the motion, um, and I think it's uh, good in light of what happened here to, to make sure that staff does the analysis. But if they find that there is a zoning change needed prior to putting the item up for sale, I think it would be helpful for your for the staff and attorney analysis to give the staff some guidance as to how they ought to proceed. Because they're they're going to I guess have to bring it to us as a as some kind of publicly initiated rezoning if yeah, they want to exactly. do that. So it, it, they ought to probably be given guidance that that's the appropriate uh, way to move if they if they get through the analysis and get to that point. Commissioner Smith. Yeah, that was my assumption. Is okay. That if they found something that needed. Um, tweaking or, or, or really fixing that they would bring back a publicly initiated, uh, whether it's a comp plan amendment or a, a rezoning, to fix it before we offer it for sale to anybody. Got it. Yes, and I, I actually that should expedite the process and be able to actually make that pro those properties more available in a more rapid manner. So I'm, I'm all for this item. Um, Commissioner Cohen, you're done. Yes. And with that, we'll do a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Hemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent. Miss Wise, do you think we can cover B4 in like four minutes? <laughs> I think we can. Okay. And B5. <laughs> <laughs> we can get through them all. Uh, B4, this is. Um, an item to remove um, an asset from the books um, for the area of the River Oaks Wastewater Treatment Facility. And speaking of affordable housing, the intent is to use this property then for affordable housing. So I'll turn it over to Beth Chanella, but Cheryl Howell is here as well if the board has any questions. 
Thank you, Ms. Bonnie. Good morning, Commissioners. Beth Scanella, Director, Water Resources Department. Item B4 requests approval for removal of the final book asset value of approximately $6.3 million associated with the water resources recently decommissioned River Oaks Wastewater Treatment Plant, as well as authorize the Clerk of the Circuit Court to remove all assets and depreciation from county inventory and records. The oak treatment, treatment facility has been demolished and the property cleared and recently sold to the Affordable Housing Department. This action is a final step and will result in compliance with Administrative Directive PI-01 for control of tangible personal property. The removal of these assets will not impact the budget or the water rates for the Water Resources Department, and both Cheryl Howell and I would be happy to answer any questions. All right, we have a motion by Second. Commissioner Cohen, Second. a second by Commissioner Myers and Kemp. Um, Ms. Howell, would you like to say something before we take a vote? Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Commissioner uh, Overman. And so affordable housing is super excited about uh, being able to uh, take advantage of this property. It's, a, it, it's in such a great location. We're working on creating a premier uh, housing development with uh, with wraparound services uh, such as health care, um, uh, social services, child care. And we're doing all of that front end work now. We're hoping to be able to create anywhere from 400 to 500 units uh, uh, on this property. And so uh, I just want to say we're so excited about it. Well, I actually happen to agree. I'm seriously sitting here doing a happy dance. So uh, thank you very much for the support of this item. And with that, we'll do a roll call vote. Okay. Oh, Commissioner Kemp. I just, just uh, for the record, I'm uh, the four to 500 units is no small amount. That right. is like uh, enormous. So I just like to uh, point that out. Um, it's, I mean, we, I don't think I know of times when I've heard about anything like that. So uh, in that with with that number so i just wanted to um i'll, I'll be very uh, i'm very excited to uh hear it moving uh forward and and knowing more that is that is um that is huge well i i will say miss howell and i have been chomping at the bit to move this forward so i really appreciate the board's support with that to a roll call vote over on yes <laughs> come on yes hagan yes Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Thank you, team. Okay, Ms. Wise. Thank you. And the last regular agenda item also is um, a Chanel's item. This is to approve a budget amendment regarding um, the capital improvement program in the public utilities area. Thank you, Beth Chanel Water Resources. Item B-5, request approval of a fiscal year 22 budget and amendment resolution to realign approximately $28.5 million from the series 2021 bond fund 40163 by deferring the Van Dyke Flow Diversion Capital Project 10300 and using those funds to increase the South County Inline Booster Station Capital Project 32011 by approximately $8.2 million and the South County Water Transmission Main Project 32013 by approximately 20.3 million. This realignment will address increasing construction costs and result in a net zero change in the CIP budget. There's no financial impact to the Water Resources Department from this realignment for the current capital program. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Move approval. Move Sorry. approval by Commissioner Smith, second by Commissioner Cohen. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, please take a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Camp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent. Thank you very much. And we are just a minute or two over, so Miss Wise, we can open up our public hearings. Perfect. So our first public hearing is item D1. This is to conduct a public hearing to accept comments on the draft analysis of impediments to fair housing choice for plan years 2022 to 2025. Cheryl Howell, Director of Affordable Housing, will present this item. Ms. Howell, you're recognized. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Ms. Wise, uh, my name is Cheryl Howell. I'm the Affordable Housing Director, and we're here to conduct a public hearing to accept comments on the draft analysis of impediments to fair housing choice for planning year 2022 through 2025. The required 30-day public comment comment period is from June 15, 2022 
to July 20th, 2022. And we're also here to close the public comment period that started June 15th, 2022, adopt the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice plan year 2023 to through 2025. And D, authorize affordable housing services to submit the plan to HUD. The analysis of impediments to fair housing choice is a document required by HUD for entitlement areas receiving community development block grant funds, home investment funds, and emergency solution grant funding. In accordance with the federal regulations, the adoption of the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice document requires a public notice, a 30-day public comment period, and a public hearing. Affordable Housing Services has prepared the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice plan year 2022 through 2025. The approval of this item will authorize the acceptance of public comments, close the public comment period, which began on June 15th, 2022 and adopt the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice plan year 2020 through through 2025. This is a public hearing and there's no fiscal impact as a result of the adoption of the report. Thank you, Ms. Howell, for that report. Um, we are going to open the public hearing. I do not have anyone signed up to speak to this particular item, but I would like to offer Ms. Howell a, a a major point of congratulations. Uh, it's a 300 page report. Uh, it's very, very, very comprehensive. If anybody wants to know what the county's doing in affordable housing, it's um, a great read as it is very, very thorough. It helps set the, the tone and the direction of what this county is doing in terms of affordable housing, especially when we see where the barriers are and where the opportunities are. So thank you very much. Not seeing any other comments. Um, Move approval. Ms. Um, we'll close the public hearing. And I have a motion by Commissioner Kemp, a second by Commissioner Smith. Not seeing any other comments. Please take a roll call vote. Foreman? Yes. Hey, Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent, thank you very much. Ms. Wise. Thank you. The next public hearing, also an affordable housing item by Ms. Howell, is to conduct a public hearing to accept comments on the proposed plan year 2022 action plan and substantial amendments for various plan years. Excellent. Ms. Howell. Thank you very much. Ms. Howell, you're recognized. Great, thank you. Uh, we're here to conduct a public hearing to accept comments on the proposed plan year 2022 action plan and the substantial amendments to PY 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21 annual action plans. And also to close the public comment period that began on June 15, 2022, adopt the plan year 2022 annual action plan and the substantial amendments to the actions pl action plans for plan year 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Uh, this annual action plan is a document required by Housing and Urban Development for Entitlement Areas receiving CDBG home investment and ESG funding. This action will allow staff to reconcile the HUD uh, Ida system and to expend earliest received grant dollars and program income. Uh, all projects in the action plan and the substantial amendments were selected uh, through a One moment, she's frozen. Me now. Okay. Okay. Well, you froze up a little bit, Miss Howell, when you got to the substantial amendments. Okay. The substantial amendments include funding year and budget adjustments for current projects and reallocation of federal funding from previous action plan years. This action will allow staff to reconcile the HUD Ida system and to expand earliest received grant dollars and program income. All projects in the, ad, in the action plan and substantial amendments were selected through a competitive RFP process. This budget will include $7.3 million in CDBG grant, uh, block grant funds, uh, $3.3 million in FY22 home partnership funds and $630,723 in FY22 ESG funds. 
this is a public hearing. Excellent, thank you very much. So we'll open the public hearing. I do not have anyone signed up to speak and I don't see anybody in the audience interested. So second. We'll close the public hearing. I have a motion by Commissioner Kemp, a second by Commissioner Myers. And with that, not seeing any further comment, please take a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Kemp? Yes. Oops, yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent, thank you very much. Ms. Wise. Thank you. The next public hearing is item D3. This is a public hearing considering enacting an ordinance established a county to impose and collect an annual non ad valorem assessment solely on property owned by hospitals or leased. Uh, Catherine Benson with the county attorney's office is here to present this item and Jean Early with healthcare services is available as well. You have p several speakers with our hospital partners who are signed up to speak. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Benson. Ms. Benson. <laughs> I've got a bunch of folks suddenly showing up here. So Ms. Benson, you're recognized. Yes. Good morning, commissioners. Catherine Benson, assistant county attorney, county attorney's office. We can't hear you, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Oh, that's all. <laughs> that was fun. Um, <laughs> good morning, commissioners. Catherine Benson, assistant county attorney, county attorney's office. This proposed ordinance will enable the county to impose and collect an annual non ad valorem special assessment that would be levied only on hospital properties in Hillsborough County. An assessment resolution would be brought back before the board each year. The special assessment would then be used to fund a hospital directed payment program, which is where the special assessment would be matched with federal funds in order to help bridge the gap between Medicaid reimbursement rates and the actual costs of care for hospitals who treat Medicaid patients. All of the hospitals in the county have requested the imposition of this ordinance and all of the hospitals in the county have represented that the cost of the assessment will not be passed along to their patients. If the special assessment is ultimately levied by the board via the assessment resolution, the ordinance provides that it will be structured to include the county's costs associated with it. This public hearing was noticed in accordance with applicable law. Jean Early, the director of healthcare services is also here if you have any questions and this is a public hearing. Thank you very much. Ms. Uh, Dr. Early, do you have anything you'd like to add? Oh, um, we can't hear you. There you go. There we go. No, no ma'am. Um, I, I think that um, at this point, I just wanted to uh, thank the county attorney's office, especially Sam Hamilton and their group for helping to uh, move this along. And I'd also like to thank uh, Bonnie Wise and um, uh, also, Carl Harness for their help in, uh, in uh, getting this to the board. Excellent. Thank you very much. This is a public hearing. I'm going to open the public hearing for public comment. I have several individuals signed up to speak today. Uh, the first person is um, Colleen Ernest, who is in person. Or, I'm sorry, Ernst, I apologize. You're recognized. You have three minutes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I'm available to, to answer any questions that the board has. If, if there are any issues um, to clarify for the record, uh, I'm here for that purpose. I do want to say um, just sincere thanks uh, for, for all of the engagement from the county, particularly the staff, um, in working through this. As, as Jean Early said, um, you know, this was a, a great effort, and we saw extreme diligence from the staff. So thank you to him, uh, thank you to the county attorney's office, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to, to have this issue considered today. Thank you very much. The next speaker is signed up uh, virtually to speak, and that's Trip Owens. Owings, or Owings. Good morning, Chair Overman and County Commission. I, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Trip Owings, and I'm the CEO of HCA Florida Brandon Hospital. And I want to express my gratitude on behalf of the Commission for our three HCA Florida hospitals that are in Hillsborough County for placing this direct payment program on your agenda. Also, I'd like to thank the county staff for their continued efforts to get this DPP to this point. Uh, the dollars that we uh, get from the program will help bridge the gap to the cost of providing Medicaid services to our patients and the reimbursements the hospitals receive from Medicaid. 
Medicaid only covers about 60% of our cost of treatment, and this program will unlock funds to help address this shortfall without increasing costs for the patient or the county. Um, we have some programs here that are, are highly Medicaid-driven, like our OB emergency services and our neonatal intensive care, as an example, and we, those programs will benefit from this. Uh, we also provide over $51 million in charity care on an annual basis for our three hospitals. And so we, again, we just wanted to take the moment to thank you for considering the direct payment program today. We appreciate your favorable support, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you very much. The next speaker signed up is Bruce Burkham. Burkham. Communications, is he available? Um, Madam Chair, oh, Bruce. Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, please proceed. Can you hear me now? Mr. Okay. Burkham. Sorry, sorry about that. Good morning. Yes. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Overman and Commissioners. I am Bruce Burgum, President and CEO of Advent Health Tampa. I'm here today to express our support for the Directed Payment Program Local Provider Participation Fund Ordinance being considered today. This program will allow us to partner with the county in providing care to those in greatest need. The ordinance shows Hillsborough County Hospitals to unlock um, funding to address the Medicaid reimbursement shortfall. Implement, implementation of the Local Provider Participation Fund provides Hillsborough County with a unique opportunity to leverage available federal dollars to help close this reimbursement gap related to uncompensated care. The program will generate critically needed funds to support the hospitals in Hillsborough County and positive economic impact in the region, all at no cost to the residents or businesses. Private hospitals and healthcare system in Hillsborough County not only provide healthcare services vital to the local community, but also generate thousands of jobs and millions of dollars in economic impact. Supporting implementation of the LPPF uh, ensures that the financial stability and viability of our hospitals and healthcare system. On behalf of Advent Health Tampa and Advent Health Carrollwood, we sincerely appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker who signed up to speak is uh, John Chorus. Hi, Commissioner. This is John Chorus. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. You may proceed. Okay. Well, great. Uh, thank you very much. The, uh, my name is John Chorus. I'm the president and CEO at Tampa General Hospital. And um, I want to add. Uh, to my colleagues' sentiments around the support of DPP funding. also want to thank not only the county commissioners, but I want to thank Bonnie and her whole team for really working hard with all of us. I'd also like to thank and recognize all the hospitals who have been collaborating on DPP funding because, as you heard, DPP funding helps generate um, additional dollars to help shore up the gap in Medicaid funding, which is critically important to care for those that, quite frankly, are underserved in our communities. The supplemental increase in Medicaid managed care reimbursement will allow Hillsborough hospitals access to additional funding without burdening local or state taxpayers, which I think is critically important. And the increase in reimbursement implemented through a hospital direct payment program will provide Hillsborough County hospitals with supplemental funding they desperately need as they serve Floridians and continue to respond to COVID-19, particularly as we are learning how to coexist with COVID-19. That's still something that is impacting all of the health systems in our, in our community. And I'd like to conclude with, with saying that this funding also allows an institution like TGH, who last year uh, provided over $80 million of care to this community, and we're very proud of that fact to folks in this community that were unable to pay for their health care. And so we're proud of that. And the DPP funding allows us to continue our very rich and longstanding history with this county to support those that are in need. And I want to thank you for your consideration on behalf of all the team members at TGH and our trustees. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. The next speaker is Steve Harris. Is Mr. Harris available? Yes, I am. Um, thank you. This is Steve Harris. I'm the Vice President of Payer and Government Affairs for Tampa General Hospital. And I'll, I'll be very brief today. Um, I would like to echo uh, John's comments and, and on behalf of TGH, thank every member of the commission for their support of the directed payment program, which will truly be a historic investment in, ind in indigent care in Hillsborough County. Uh, you, you heard Catherine Benson talk about the, what Medicaid shortfall is. That number for Hillsborough County hospitals is annually over $200 million. So you can start, you can see the historical significance of this program. And I'll also echo an important message from John that this is all being done to unlock federal dollars without uh, any burden whatsoever on local or state taxpayers. And, and let me just finish up by uh, really uh, offering a sincere thanks to uh, Administrator Bonnie Wise, uh, Jean Early, and Catherine Benson for their leadership in bringing this ordinance before the commission today. And that concludes my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker who signed up to speak is Kimberly Guy. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Kimberly Guy. I'm the president of Bay Care St. Joseph's Hospital. Um, thank you for allowing me to address the commission on behalf of Bay Care and our six hospitals in Hillsborough County. With over 17,000 team members in Hillsborough County and $2.9 billion in economic impact, we are extremely proud of our contribution to the county's economical and physical well-being. I'm here today as BayCare's representative to express our support of the commission adopting an ordinance to establish a local provider participation fund to address funding shortfalls for Hillsborough County healthcare providers. This will help us continue to meet the growing need for healthcare services in the county. This funding mechanism has been approved by the state of Florida and CMS. Even before the public health crisis, most of Florida hospitals were only reimbursed a fraction of the cost they incur in caring for Medicaid patients. Today, there is a record 5.3 million Floridians that are enrolled in the state's Medicaid program. As it stands right now, Medicaid reimbursement rates only cover 58 cents of every dollar spent on care, the Medicaid shortfall. Through the LPPF model, all hospitals in Hillsborough County will be assessed via non ad valorem special assessment. This will then be matched by the federal government. By fully leveraging this opportunity for federal dollars, Hillsborough County will be ensuring greater resources to serve the community's health care needs including provider health care providers with the critical support to hire and retain our workforce to be ready to serve our community. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Um, my phone is not receiving updated emails for some reason, so I don't have anyone or an update on anyone else that signed up to speak today, but seeing none, I will close the public hearing and open it up for board discussion. Move approval. approval. Second. Okay. Okay, I think I have multiple approved move motions. <laughs> I think it was Commissioner White and the second by Commissioner Cohen. Um, I see Commissioner Kemp. You've said, uh, and I know there was a lot said about it, but I'll just reiterate because I've heard uh, a, a lot from the hospitals too about the kind of big lift uh, that the uh, county administrator, Bonnie Wise, our county attorney's office in particular, uh, did and Gene Early to make this possible and to bring in, uh, you know, uh, multi uh, millions of dollars to support our hospitals and health care in Hillsborough County that we otherwise wouldn't have uh, at no cost to us is certainly something that uh, needed to uh, needed to be happen, needed to happen. And I know that there was a, a barrier that was uh, looked at as quite substantial to that um, initially, but um, thanks to the staff for the big lift they did on that. Excellent, thank you very much. Commissioner Cohen. I, I just wanna underscore what Commissioner Kemp just said. This did, was not something that was just a rubber stamp. This was a lot of work on a lot of people's parts and it involved, I think, probably everybody here in order to get this done. And I, I also wanna thank the administrator and the county attorney's office. Um, I too uh, wanna thank not only the industry the entire industry that's worked on this, um, all the representatives of the healthcare industry, as well as our staff in looking for a solution. Um, you know, when people are looking for an opportunity for government to partner with private enterprise to solve problems, here's a perfect example of having um, 
you know, private enterprises work, come together to work together to provide solutions and partnering with government to make uh, opportunity work uh, within the complexities of, of federal and local funding. So I just want to thank the entire team on both sides of the, of the game uh, to getting this done. And with that, uh, not seeing any further comments, we'll take a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Going? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Stamp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent, thank you very much, everyone. Item uh, D4, Ms. Wise? Yes, thank you. The next item is item D4. This is a public hearing regulating the use of fertilizers containing nit nitrogen and or phosphorus within unincorporated Hillsborough County. Vivian Arena Spaddles with the County Attorney's Office will present this item. We have other staff available as well if the board has any questions, including Kevin Moran, Rick Valdez, and Eric Card of the Tampa Sports Authority. Excellent, thank you very much. This is a public hearing, but we need we will have a report first and then I'll open up the hearing. Okay. Good morning. This is Vivian Arena Spaddles with the County Attorney's Office. Again, this is a public hearing to consider an amendment to Chapter 24, Article 5 of the Hillsborough County Code of Ordinances and Laws. On November 17, 2021, you adopted Ordinance 21-42, which created Article 5 regulating the use of fertilizers containing nitrogen and or phosphorus within unincorporated Hillsborough County. This ordinance would amend Article 5 to allow for the proper maintenance of sports fields with specialized turf. The amendment is necessary to protect the significant financial investment made by Hillsborough County Parks and Recreation and others in developing high quality sports fields within unincorporated Hillsborough County and to protect the health and safety of the athletes that use these facilities. If adopted, the amendment to Article 5 would again apply within unincorporated Hillsborough County only. Amend Section 24-195 of the definition of specialized turf to include golf courses and golf practice areas, including the tee boxes, greens, and fairways. The sports fields, including areas immediately adjacent to the uh, play surface, such as um, sidelines or foul territory. It would also amend section 24-201 of the exemptions as to sports fields with specialized turf to require that they follow the best management practices as embodied in the best management practices for the sports field manager, which is a professional guide to environmental sports field management and any applicable state regulations, including rule 5E-1.003 of the Florida Administrative Code. This Ordinance was duly noticed in accordance with applicable law. And again, this is a public hearing and staff and I are available for any questions. Excellent, thank you very much. With that, I'll open up the public hearing. I'm seeing no other reports from staff. We're good. Um, open up the public hearing. I do not have anyone signed up to speak to this item. Has there been any updates? No? Okay, great. So with that, I'll close the public hearing and take for board comment. Thank you. Oh, Commissioner Smith, you recognize? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to make two quick points about this. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward, uh, small amendment to this. But uh, the, in the first place, whenever we're making new rules or rule changes, whether it's a new ordinance or a land development code or a, a new comp plan amendment, we are uh, sometimes um, uh, sometimes people bring forward concerns at the very last minute, at the, at the 11th hour when we're about to pass something, even though we've had a lengthy process of hearings and, and workshops on it. And um, sometimes it uh, can be used as a tactic. Sometimes, like in this case, it's just uh, people were not aware of what we were doing until the very last minute. And... Um, I think this is a good example of what we did in this case and what we've done in a, a couple of other cases, that it's always possible to pass the initial big package of a, a rule or a, a, some rule change in land use, whatever it is, and then with the understanding that 
some last minute concerns can be accommodated by going back through the process, bringing it back soon afterwards uh, in uh, amending and tweaking it. So we don't have to be afraid of uh, you know, every little hypothetical edge case that might be brought forward um, it to in some of the other uh, kinds of things we look at. Um, we can rest assured that we can, like we are doing here, um, uh, tweak um, a, a, an ordinance with uh, really good input, in this case, uh, um, really good concerns that were brought forward by our uh, parks department. Um, the other point I want to make is for the record. Uh, this, this small change that we're making to the fertilizer ordinance does not apply to every little playground. I mean, the term sports field is not for any little playground at a charter school or a private school or a, an HOA maintained um, field playground or, or uh, CDDs. It is specifically, and we worked really, I know the uh, uh, attorneys worked really hard to um, craft this, another reason why it took a little more time, uh, to only apply to bona fide sports fields with specialized turf, which is defined here, um, and, and uh, only where that specialized turf is managed by specialized turf managers, and those specialized turf managers are still required to follow the best management practices as they do, which are spelled out in the uh, best management practices for the sports field manager, a professional guide for environmental sports field management, and that's published by the Sports Turf Managers Association, as well as any uh, applicable state regulations. So this is a really narrow um, little uh, uh, application case for just those um, professionally maintained sports fields, like uh, some of the ones that the county maintains. So I just want to make those two points. And with that, I'll uh, move approval. We have a motion to approve, uh, second by Commissioner Kemp. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Yes, and I just wanted to um, uh, thank Commissioner Smith for her incredible diligence, as usual, uh, on this particular issue. And I know, um, because we had talked about it before, I think both of us were part of an effort in 2010, yes, to, and I remember coming down here to these offices to, uh, to speak to this issue, was met with commissioners and tried to move this forward and was confused about at the time what exactly ever, couldn't remember what exactly ever happened, but we were behind other counties on, uh, you know, on having really uh, done our diligence on this. And so I, I thank you for continuing with it and for doing it down to this fine line here uh, and the work that you that you did and I think as um, you stated you know we, we came to a place uh, that was that was a good place so um, thank you for all that work it's extraordinarily important as we know with red tide and our water issues and our pollution issues uh, and and it's important for us um, to uh, set the example and protecting our environment to the greatest extent possible. So thank you. Thank you very much. I agree. It's due time for us to get this moving forward. I, I initially, when we came up, I was like, we didn't do that already? So I'm really glad to see that. Commissioner Cohen, you're Yeah, I just wanted to add on that point. Uh, Commissioner Smith, you, you uh, rightly um, deserve the credit for bringing this forward because you've been working on it for a long time. I remember when we did this in the city of Tampa back in 2012. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the problem was that because the surrounding jurisdictions hadn't done it, it really didn't mean anything. It only means something if everybody does it, which is what protects the water, and this is the last piece. And thank you again for bringing it forward because that, that closing of that gap is really gonna be what makes the water quality so much better. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any further comments. Please take a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. 
White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent, thank you very much. Ms. Wise. Thank you. The next public hearing is item D5. This is a public hearing relating to the Bloomingdale Special Dependent District. Um, also from the County Attorney's Office, we have Deborah Cromarty Mincy to present this item. Thank, Thank you, you, Bonnie. Good morning, Commissioners. Deborah Cromarty Mincy, County Attorney's Office. This public hearing is to consider proposed revisions to Hillsborough County Ordinance 85-38 as amended to include a few housekeeping changes including allowing members of the Bloomingdale Board to attend meetings virtually and make small purchases with a bank card in compliance with Florida statutes and internal procedures, and requiring district compliance with county regulations for maintenance of the district's community screening walls, such as painting and pressure washing its, in, its interior, exterior, sorry. Also included in this proposal is an update reflecting the $170 per parcel special assessment approved by the voters in 2018. In addition, I would like to correct a minor Scrivener's error found on line 79 and 80 of the attached ordinance. The words ABDUB, A-B-D-U-B, should be replaced with the words AND, IN, A-N-D, I-N. The board authorized scheduling and advertising this public hearing at your last board meeting and all associated at legal advertising requirements have been met. With me are county staff Joshua Bellotti and Mary Mahoney. Uh, we are all here available uh, to answer any questions you may have. Again, this is a public hearing and I uh, thank you commissioners. Thank you very much. I have I don't think we have anyone. No, actually, we, we do have several people that, that as I mentioned, as, or as was mentioned, this is a public hearing. We have uh, what looks like three people signed up to speak here. Uh, the first one is Thomas Leach, and it, this person is in, in person. Is Thomas Leach available? Yes, good morning. Uh the first, the first, I have in this order, Thomas Leach, Matt Newton, and Ron Cristaldi. So is Thomas Leach available? Yes, Oh, you're all working together? Yeah. We're, okay. all, we're all here on all right. the same time. Take your turns. You're all recognized. You have three minutes each. Good morning, Commission, and Madam Chair, happy birthday. Thank you. Um, Matt Newton, Shoemaker, Lupin Kendrick, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard here in Tampa. Um, and I just want to start off by saying that today is the culmination of a lot of meetings, a lot of phone calls. Um, in many ways, local government is a team sport. And here in Hillsborough County, we have a heck of a team. Um, it was a true pleasure. Um, I really appreciate the professionalism and responsiveness of staff. Um, I'm here today to answer questions. Of course, uh, Tom Leach and my partner, Ron Cristaldi, are here as well. Uh, appreciate your consideration. And uh, thank you again for your time. Thank you very much. Good morning, my name is Tom Leach. I'm the president of the Bloomingdale Special Dependent District. I wanna thank you for your consideration and I yield my time in support of the measure. Excellent, thank you very much. Morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Ron Cristaldi with the Shoemaker Firm representing Bloomingdale. We just wanted to thank you all for your consideration and recognize uh, Commissioner White for his support along the way in the process and um, the County Attorney's Office, uh, Deborah and, and Christine and, and others for their tremendous help and we'll yield the rest of my time in support of the, of the item. Thank you. Excellent. Very, I'm not seeing any other speakers uh, signed up to speak. I'll close the public hearing and I'll recognize Commissioner White. Thank you. I just want to thank um, all the members of the Bloomingdale Special Taxing District for all of their hard work, Mr. Cristaldi and re representing them. I want to thank our staff, um, including uh, Deborah, uh, on a job well done. Um, the Bloomingdale Special Ta Taxing District Board, one of the things you see referenced here, uh, memorialized uh, as, as presented to us, and uh, that was important. Um, just appreciate the hard work, and I'll move approval of the item. David, <clears throat> motion by Commissioner Wise, second by Commissioner Smith. Um, I, too, want to thank everyone here. Uh, you know, today's been a great day of good government. I am so impressed. But with that, not seeing any other... Oh, Commissioner Smith, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just a quick point um, about something that I've, I've tried to work on in, in other committees, like the Transportation Disadvantage Committee of the 
TPO um, to try to um, make things easier to, to do the kind of things um, this uh, special taxing district or special dependent district is trying to do where, to make it easier on their volunteer members to vote uh, and have those votes count even when some members are participating virtually. And um, uh, it, it's, it's really important, especially with these volunteer committees um, but I'm also trying to look into how we can do this with the TPO without having that vote before every meeting. I think it can be done. So I'll just put that out there. Thank you. Yep. Quorums are so much fun. <laughs> and in-person quorums are also uh, challenging, but especially when you have volunteers that are serving our community well to, to give them an opportunity to continue to serve without that barrier to entry and, and progress is, is important. So thank you very much for bringing this forward. With that, I don't see any other further comments. We've closed the public hearing and we'll take a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Hemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Ms. Wise. Thank you. Uh, the next public hearings, uh, D6 and D9, are related to solid waste. The first one's a public hearing to change the term of services rendered for the solid waste non ad valorem collection disposal assessments from a calendar year to a fiscal year. And with that, Hank Ennis will take us through that public hearing, and then the other one will follow. Thank you very much. Mr. Ennis, you're recognized. Yes, um, uh, Hank Ennis, County Attorney's Office. Commissioner, this is a public hearing to consider uh, amendments to Chapter 130 of the Hillsborough County Creative Ordinance and Laws relating to solid waste collection and disposal. Um, as you know, the clerk of the court withholds 25% of the revenue collected by the solid waste department. Uh, because we provide our services on a calendar year instead of a fiscal year. This amendment will change that to a fiscal year. That's the only change being proposed in this ordinance, and uh, this is a public hearing. Thank you. I don't have anyone signed up to speak on the... Oh, we do. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We do have one person in person to speak on... D6, that is listed as Mr. Thomas Foley. Is he still present? There you are. Mr. Foley, you're recognized. Hassan? Good morning, Commissioners. Thank you again for letting me speak to you today. Regarding uh, D6, uh, whether you pass it or not, solid waste has currently over $200 million of cash sitting on their books. As evidenced in their recent annual financial statement. Um, this is merely an accounting change that they're looking to do, rather having an accrual of 25% of current year revenues deferred into the following fiscal year, because the fiscal year and your calendar assessment year are different. Um, regardless, they have the cash. In fact, $213 million worth of cash is enough to fund solid waste operations, debt service, and their renew and replacement program for two years. So whether you charge a single county resident for disposal or collection for the next two years, you stop collecting from them. They still have enough cash on hand to operate for two years. So they have the cash regardless of this change to the county ordinance. Solid Waste Department, like all other departments, budgets their revenue and expenses that they project they will receive during the course of a fiscal year. So they have the cash. This is really not a necessary ordinance to do, especially on top of the fact that last year, solid waste increased both its disposal and collection rates by 25% and 17%. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have anybody else signed up to speak, so I'm going to close the public hearing and open it up for board discussion. Move approval. Move second. approval by Commissioner Kemp, a second by Commissioner Myers. 
Um, is there any board discussion? Okay. I, I just would like to say I am very pleased to see that this does a great job of opening up what is normally, given our accounting system, a requirement to hold reserves um, that cannot be used to help reduce uh, solid waste fees in this next fiscal year. And so by going through this exercise, it's my understanding, it helps us actually hold, hold fees at a, at a better rate than what we had scheduled based on the projected cost uh, on the contracts that we have issued for this service. So I want to thank staff for their due diligence in looking for ways to address the impact of potentially increasing fees. And, um, and with that, we'll take a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagen? Yes. Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent, thank you very much. Ms. Wise. Thank you. Uh, the next public hearing is item D9. This is regarding the uh, establishment of the solid waste rates per non ad valorem and the collection of assessments for another fees and charges and for fiscal year 2023. And as um, the chair mentioned, there is no proposed change to the non ad valorem assessment amount for residential customers. And with that, uh, Ms. Kim Beyer will present this item. We also have our consultant, uh, Terry Bovary, with Raptelis, available if the board has any questions. Excellent, thank you very much. Ms. Beyer, you're recognized. Good morning, commissioners. This is Kim Byer, Solid Waste Department Director. We're here today to conduct a public hearing to adopt and adopt the resolution which establishes a solid waste non ad valorem disposal and collection assessment and other user fees and charges and the solid waste disposal and collection rules for fiscal year 2023. There is no proposed change to the non ad valorem assessment amount for residential customers. At this time, I have a brief presentation associated with this request. If HDB, if HDB TV chair, chair, thank you. Next slide, please. Our solid waste customers pay for solid waste services through a non ad valorem assessment that is shown on their annual tax bill. It's shown as two separate charges, a disposal assessment and a collection assessment. In fiscal year F22, uh, the solid waste assessment was $352.79. Next slide, please. There is no proposed increase or change to the non ad valorem assessment amount for residential customers. It will remain at 352.79. This was achieved by modifying the assessment period from a calendar year to a fiscal year, which eliminated the need for to restrict funds for referral for revenue deferrals. This is a one time significant benefit that will fund solid waste operations for three months in fiscal year 2023. Next slide, please. In 2020, a multi year phased increase to solid waste rates was planned to fund collection contract increases as well as operating cost. The planned phased increase will be recommended to resume in FY24. However, the use of the deferred revenue allowed us for this year only to hold rates flat. Next slide, please. We are proposing an increase in the municipal and commercial disposal fees. These are the fees charged to our commercial and municipal customers for the use of our landfill and our resource recovery facility. These increases are driven by an increase in our contractual costs, as well as the need to invest in capital to extend the life of, the life of our existing facilities and fund the expansion of new facilities to process our increasing solid waste volumes. This concludes my presentation. I have a, I have a rate consultant here with Raft Ellis to answer any questions you may have regarding this rate development. This is a public hearing and we have received 21 public comments and have, they have been entered into the public record. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, with that, this is a public hearing. Um, they, I do have two individuals that have signed up to speak. I don't know whether or not Mr. Mr. Mira had signed up prior to Mr. Foley, so I can't determine the priority there. But if Mr. Mira is still available, he had signed up to speak regarding this public hearing. Is he still online? Uh, Madam Chair, he actually disconnected. He did disconnect, okay. And with that, um, I thank him for, for letting us know that he wanted to. Um, and with that, I'll recognize Mr. Foley. Thank you. 
his um, on this particular item. Thank goodness, solid waste is not raising residential collection and disposal fees this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, I'll close the public hearing and open it up for board discussion. Move approval. Second. second. We have a motion by Commissioner Cohen, a second by Commissioner Kemp and Myers. With that, please take a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagen? Commissioner Hagen? Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Thank you. Motion carried six to zero. Excellent. Thank you very much. Ms. Wise. Thank you. Now we're on to item D7. This is a public hearing to establish uniform rates for the various street lighting classifications for the fiscal year, uh, for the calendar year 2022 by approving the rate schedule. Uh, Josh Bellotti is here to present this item and Mr. John Lyons is also available for any questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Bellotti, you're recognized. Hello, thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Josh Bellotti, Engineering and Operations Department. This is a public hearing to adopt the annual rates for the county's residential street lighting special purpose district. This non ad valorem tax assessment funds the cost of providing street lighting services through TECO to residential street lighting districts throughout unincorporated Hillsborough County. The county's residential street lighting assessment has not changed since 2017, when it was increased by 16% to cover a TECO rate increase. This January, a new TECO rate increase went into effect, approved by the Public Service Commission, in order to meet the financial obligations of the program, an additional $2 million in revenue is needed going forward to cover this recent TECO rate increase, as well as replenish program reserves, which have been depleted covering the increase thus far. This amounts to a 20.5% rate increase applied uniformly to all street lighting uh, customers. The effect that this rate increase will have on property owners varies by district, depending on the type of street lighting. For the majority of the 127,000 street lighting customers, this will amount to a $13.10 increase to the annual assessment. The county mailed written notices on June 27th to all property owners who receive street lighting service, advertised the public hearing through legal notice in the Tampa Bay Times on June 26th in accordance with statutes. Those notices state that property owners have the right to file written objections. To date, Public Works has received 10 written objections to the 2022 street lighting assessment increase. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. This is a public hearing. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we'll uh, open it up for public hearing. I have one person signed up, Mr. Foley. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. With that, we'll close the public hearing, open it up for board discussion or move for approval. Second. second. Motion by Commissioner Myers. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner White. Uh, a second by Commissioner Kemp. Commissioner White, you're recognized. Thank you very much. I, I just want to verify um, for the record that this is um, by and large a pass-through rate increase from the utility company. I mean, I do recognize that the county has some very small administrative fees that go along with administering this program, but by and large, the Board of County Commissioners is simply acting as a pass-through agent for a, a rate increase by the utility. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. I think that's important for us to recognize. We, we don't want to raise fees any more than anybody else, but when we, the costs are there, it is fiscally and financially responsible uh, to deal with those increased costs. So thank you very much, Commissioner White, for those comments. Commissioner Smith, you're recognized. And just an additional point, thank you, Commissioner White, for clarifying that for the record, but also this only applies to those neighborhoods that have opted in to uh, the street lighting program. So it doesn't apply across the board only to those neighborhoods that wanted to have this extra service from TECO. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. I don't see any other comments. And with that, uh, seeing none, we'll ask for a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagen? Kim? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Thank you, motion carried, six to zero. Excellent, thank you very much. Ms. Wise. Thank you. Um, one more public hearing. This is a public hearing to establish the stormwater management non-ad valorem assessment rates and non-ad valorem assessment role for calendar year 2022. 
and um, Josh is going to get another opportunity to present to you today. And John Lyons is also here if there are any questions. Mr. Bellotti, it's the Bellotti Show today, so please proceed. You're recognized. Yes, thank you very much, commissioners. Uh, this is the annual public hearing to set the stormwater assessment rates for the upcoming tax, uh, tax year. And so I just want to lead in with a real brief recap on the stormwater management program and where we stand with the assessment rates. In 2019, the board approved what amounted to a five-year plan to achieve a sustainable level for the stormwater program's maintenance, asset preservation, flood protection, and water quality. Prior to that, the stormwater fee was a flat $42 per year for all properties. With the new plan, the county adopted a tiered rate system and the majority of residential property owners falling into the middle tier was set at $76 per year. The five-year plan also included incremental increases over the following four years, taking the middle tier to a maximum rate that the board approved at $96 per year. That five-year plan would allow the county to begin to address needs that had been deferred over the course of years when the stormwater rates were inadequately low. The county's approach was to focus the initial revenue increases in the first years on maintenance, ramping up our efforts on things like contracted ditch cleaning and pipe replacements. When we came to you for the first of those incremental increases, it happened to be in the midst of the first year of the pandemic in the summer of 2020, and the board made the decision to postpone the increase and hold the rates flat. The board decided to hold the rates flat again in 2021 and opted to supplement with $17.5 million of American Rescue Plan funds. Last year, the county also implemented the hardship exemption for residents that met the low income and property criteria. So at this time, the stormwater rates remain at the initial level established in 2019. And what's proposed is to begin with the first of the planned incremental increases, which for the middle tier residential property would increase from $76 to $81 per year. So what will the county do with that increase? First, I can share what we have already done in the last two years. As you know, the stormwater system is large and complex, comprised of over 14 million total feet of drainage pipes and ditches, over 40,000 drainage structures, 2,000 ponds, and 38 pump stations. The goals of the stormwater management program are to enhance community resiliency and public safety and to reduce the risk to the community from the impacts of flooding. The efforts in these first two years of the five-year plan, funded by that initial rate increase in 2019, have been focused on addressing years of deferred maintenance and aging infrastructure, and have included over 14,000 feet of new pipe installed, over 8,000 feet of culvert replacements. And additionally, our maintenance teams have cleaned over 80 miles of ditches, replaced over 31,000 feet of curb and gutter, and mowed over 22,000 acres. Moving forward into the next phase of the five-year plan, we turn our focus to improving the stormwater system, enhancing neighborhood resiliency by reducing flooding impacts, and enhancing water quality through treatment of stormwater runoff and reduction of nutrient loads. And we do this through flood protection projects in some of our community's most frequently flooded areas. Now, while we did not receive the planned revenue increase this past year, the board did approve one-time American Rescue Plan funds to go towards those efforts funding several flood protection projects. And going forward, the additional $2.4 million in projected annual revenue generated by this first incremental rate increase will help us continue that focus on neighborhood flood protection. For example, the county is pro projecting to have 55 more neighborhood flood protection projects ready to implement over the next four years, but it will require approximately $18 million in order to construct them. So in summary, this is a look at the five-year table of rates showing the incremental increases year to year. Column on the left shows the rates adopted in 2019, which have held until this year. And the columns to the right show the planned increases up to the maximum rate adopted in 2019 as well. For fiscal year 23, proceeding with the first of the planned incremental increases would increase the middle tier residential rate by $5 annually from $76 to $81. And as you can see at the very bottom, it would result in $2.4 million in projected annual uh, additional revenue. So current timeline for the rates, we're here today on July 20th at the public hearing. We mailed out written notices on June 27th to 7,813 property owners that'll either receive the assessment for the first time or have it modified due to property modifications. And we duly noticed this public hearing in the Tampa Bay Times on June 26th. Those notices state that property owners have the right to file written objections 
To date, Public Works has received one written objection to the 2022 stormwater assessment increase. Once the new rates are adopted, they will go into effect October 1st. That concludes my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. This is a public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Velotti. I truly appreciate that. As you mentioned, this is a public hearing. I have one person signed up to speak to this item. That's Mr. Foley. Mr. Foley, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thomas Foley, Hillsborough County. Um, if the current proposal to raise the rate is only going to increase uh, revenue by $4 million, the stormwater fund currently has about $35 million unspent in it. The stormwater fund does not spend this kind of capital outlay money. $50 million is listed on um, Mr. Bellotti's presentation. It spends considerably less than the amount taken in. I would recommend that the board consider pushing this off for another year and not doing this increase. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have anyone else uh, signed up to speak with that, so I'll close the public hearing. Move open it approval. Up. We have a motion by second. Commissioner Kemp, a uh, second by Commissioner Myers. Seeing no other further comments, I just did want to say thank you very much for the for the hard work that's been done here, for the plan that's going forward, and for the hardship program that was cr created for those individuals that would be impacted by this in an adverse way. I think it's important that we recognize that some communities um, don't have the resources to do this, and having that program is very important. And with that, we'll do a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? No. Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? No. Motion carried 5 to 2. Commissioners Hagan and White voted no. Thank you. Ms. Wise? Uh, thank you. Um, we're almost at 11 o'clock, and that is the. Oh. That nope. clock, that we're, clock we're, says 11 o'clock, so yeah. we'll, we'll go with that. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the um, item for the delivery of the county administrator's uh, recommended budget, and I will be doing that along with uh, Mr. Brickey. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to switch over my papers here. Um, I wanted to let you know we're pleased to present the uh, fiscal year 2023 budget. It is um, $8.559 billion. And as a reminder, this is the second year of the county's two-year budget process. This is the budget book. They have been delivered to your office. There'll be two books. One is the recommended budget, and one is for the capital. And the uh, budget is available online as well. And so for the public to access that, um, that really pretty picture is from Lake Dan Nature Preserve over in Odessa. Um, the county remains in a solid financial position, and the county continues to maintain its AAA bond rating from all three of the credit uh, rating agencies. Tax value growth associated with the fiscal year 23 budget is strong and higher than originally anticipated, approximately 15%. We do not expect increases of this magnitude to continue into the future. However, while revenue growth is strong, the county is experiencing significant inflationary pressures and a very challenging labor market. Inflation rates are at 40-year highs nationally, averaging in excess of 8% in recent months, with local data showing local inflation even higher at about 11%. Fuel and energy prices are rising, although stabilizing a little bit uh, more recently. Inflation and related supply chain issues have also presented challenges for our capital improvement program. Construction costs are high and quality contractors are extremely busy. I'm sure you all are facing a lot of this in your personal lives as well. Employers, both in the private and public sectors, are experiencing fierce competition for qualified staffing and therefore wages are rapidly rising in response. In fact, the county has lost a significant number of employers of, um, of staff to employers due to this tight labor market. The county, as with other organizations and businesses across the region and the nation, is finding it difficult to recruit new employees, making many job openings here and elsewhere very difficult to fill. And these issues can affect the delivery of important services and place an increased workload on the existing staff. 
There remains continued pressure, especially in the unincorporated area, to deliver valuable services citizens both deserve and rely upon. Addressing public safety needs is paramount. The sheriff is faced with a growing population, staffing pressures, and much needed jail improvements. Fire Rescue 2 is faced with a growing population and staffing pressures, yet the department continues to deliver service in a quality way, especially amidst a pandemic. I must stress the needs here are great, and we need to continue to keep the goal of improving response times and building more stations as a priority. A large portion of the new growth that we have received must be committed to these issues. My priorities in developing the recommended budget include providing for financial stability, maintaining our assets, investing in our workforce, public safety, including the addition of a new fire station and adding two new rescue units, and the strategic funding of other critical residential services. The budget I'm presenting today reflects these priorities and I believe continues to serve the best interest of our residents. Finally, the recommended budget also provides additional and general and community, and, uh, sorry, community investment tax funds for further investment by the board. I'd like to thank the county employees who strive each and every day to improve the lives of the Hillsborough County residents. Their work is appreciated and valued. And I'd also like to thank you, the board, for your input, your guidance, and observations throughout the budget process and throughout the year. We believe that this recommended budget reflects many of the priorities that you have expressed. Kevin Brickey is now going to go a little bit more detail into the budget and also into the timeline. And as I mentioned, for the public's information, the budget is available online and we will have various um, public um, opportunities for the public to um, participate in the budget process. Kevin will go through all those dates with you. And with that, we'll be available for comments and questions after Kevin's presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Mr. Brickey, you're recognized. Thank you, Ms. Wise and Commissioners. Kevin Brickey, Management and Budget. And I will share my screen. Did that work? Hopefully. Yes, we can see it. Very good. Thank you. Uh, so today uh, I want to go through some of the uh, details of the uh, county administrators recommended FY23 budget. Uh, as Ms. Wise mentioned, this is the uh, second year of our two year budget process. And at a starting point, it is uh, uh, important to note the the growth in taxable values, which uh, lead to our property tax revenue, has been very strong uh, for FY23. Uh, the recommended budget is built on the property appraiser's June 1 estimate of, of values, and that was a 14.1% increase uh, from the previous uh, July 1 values. And that is, that is the uh, highest increase in uh, 16 years. The property appraiser has since uh, released uh, his July 1 preliminary estimates, which the adopted budget is always built upon, and that increase is approximately 15% from the previous July 1 estimate. Again, that's the uh, highest rate of growth in 16 years. It is uh, quite a bit above our 20-year average annual growth rate, that uh, uh, red or orange line, which is about 5.4%. Uh, that reflects uh, times that were above trend, above the uh, red line, and sometimes when we're below. You'll note that uh, in that in the Great Recession, after we had that large increase in, in property tax uh, or in taxable values in fiscal years five, six, seven, uh, when seven was 21 percent, uh, eight was 11 percent, we had four years five years of, of decreases in, in taxable values. And you see that in that dip uh, from fiscal year nine to 13. Uh, since then, we've been uh, a little bit uh, somewhat above long run trend. And again, we're at about 15%. Now there's a, a, a 
some important differences between now and the time of the, the Great Recession, uh, when housing markets uh, actually saw great declines and, and taxable value saw great declines. At that time, um, uh, consumer debt burdens were high, business debt burdens were high. The banking system was uh, in difficulty with uh, somewhat poor capitalization and quite a lot of loans that weren't performing and uh, uh, were um, defaulting. Uh, this time around, it, consumers are and businesses are in a much better position when it comes to debt burdens. Banks are well capitalized. Uh, so we, we, we think that the 15%, while it's certainly high right now, is, is something that's not sustainable over the long run. Uh, but we don't feel that uh, we're, we're in line for actual decreases in taxable values in future years, but certainly uh, a decline in the rate of growth uh, more towards long run uh, average growth, 5% plus or minus. And then this is the actual uh, levels of uh, taxable value countywide. The previous was uh, percent growth. And here you can see that dip. You see in, in fiscal year eight, uh, there was a peak of $88 uh, billion. And it took 11 years, and you see the, the one, two, three, four, five years of, of decline. It took 11 years before we were able to uh, surpass that previous peak. And that occurred in uh, FY19. Uh, Now, at the same time as we have very uh, strong revenue growth uh, from property taxes, although we expect that uh, uh, again is 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 above our trend, as Bonnie mentioned, we also have some uh, strong cost and price uh, pressures that we're dealing with. This is the 12 month percent change in the consumer price index or inflation. Uh, the latest number for June. 22 is 9.1%. That's the highest in nearly 41 years. The previous high was in November of 81 at 9.6%. Uh, and the, the increases in prices are, are pretty broad based. Of course, we all know fuel costs are up, but food housing costs are, are also up. Uh, and then looking at um, what uh, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports for uh, Tampa Bay area inflation, the la latest number is actually about 11% uh, locally. And we also have uh, challenging labor markets at the uh, moment, as, as Ms. Wise mentioned. Uh, this is unemployment rates. The current unemployment rate uh, in the county for May to 2022 is 2.3%. That's the lowest uh, since 2006, prior to the Great Recession, you see that large spike in in uh, 2020 during the uh, COVID shutdowns, and then uh, the decline since then. Uh, so we are at a very uh, low uh, unemployment rate, which uh, really is translated into uh, a tight labor market where it's difficult to uh, recruit and retain employees. And looking at job openings, uh, job openings uh, across the nation are about 11 million uh, jobs, which is uh, close to uh, double what it's been in, in uh, uh, recent years. So these are job openings that are going unfilled at the moment and employers are, are uh, struggling to uh, deal with how to fill those job openings. Looking at Florida job openings, it's the same pattern. Uh, there are currently about 752,000 uh, job openings as of April, and that's well above the recent numbers of about 300 to 400,000. So this has led to, again, that difficulty in, in recruiting and retaining, and wages are also starting to rise as a result, as, as uh, employers are, 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 again, trying to deal with, with, with that difficulty. Currently, average hourly earnings in, in the U.S. are rising about 5 to 6% in recent months, which, looking at that graph compared to 
uh, much of the recent past over the last 10, 12 years, that rate has been somewhere in the neighborhood of one to 3%. So wages are indeed uh, rising more rapidly. Turning towards some of the detail of the recommended budget, um, Ms. Wise mentioned the FY23 recommended budget is about $8.6 billion. That's about a $1 billion increase over the FY22 uh, adopted budget that you adopted uh, last September. That's a 14% increase. Uh, the, the capital budget in FY23 accounts for uh, $762 million of that total increase, so about 75% of that increase. New bond issuances for our water wastewater pro programs, about $460 million. Uh, solid waste as well, $51 million. Uh, ELAP, a new ELAP issuance of about $32 million, and some ARP projects really account for most of that increase. This graph shows uh, the primary areas uh, that uh, you are funding uh, across the budget as a whole, across all funds. The sheriff is about 16.7% of the total budget or about $542 million. Our enterprise funds, that's our water, wastewater, solid waste uh, is about 14%. And uh, that is uh, $455 million. And fire rescue across all funds is about 7.4% uh, uh, or $240 million. So looking at uh, sheriff and fire rescue are two main areas of uh, public safety across the entire budget. That's about 24% of uh, expenditures. Uh, other large uh, areas, healthcare services, uh, $238 million or about 7.3%, uh, various debt services supporting our capital improvement programs, uh, $206 million, about 6.3%. Uh, government agencies are about $186 million. Uh, you see in there that we also have uh, continuing COVID-19 relief funds more towards the left, uh, about uh, uh, $85 million. Uh, and uh, library services, $54 million, uh, and reserves, total reserves, about $1.9 billion, and our capital projects, also about $1.9 uh, billion. Turning towards uh, the general funds where uh, the board has the most discretion, uh, we'll look at the countywide general fund uh, first. This is the fund that serves uh, sir, fund services for all countywide residents. Uh, our operating millage is about 5.7309 mills on all assessed properties. That's about $1,146 on a home assessed with uh, $250,000 of value. Uh, it funds the sheriff. That's primarily the sheriff's jail operations and support functions. Uh, funds uh, the other Constitutional officers, the clerk of the court, the supervisor of elections, tax collector, property appraiser, court operations, uh, countywide function, uh, human services, uh, which includes social services, of course, uh, conservation and, uh, and, and some parks. Uh, it's mainly conservation in this case, uh, affordable housing, uh, emergency management, medical examiner, pet resources, uh, our Environmental Protection Commission, and uh, support services uh, such as human resources in my department uh, budget. These are services that are provided whether one is in the unincorporated area or in the three cities. For FY23, the Countywide General Fund, the budget is about $1.3 billion. That includes $267 million in reserves and some uh, $68 million in uh, indirect costs that's from other funds that support uh, the back office operations. But looking at uh, uh, the, the bar graph, the sheriff, and remember this is the sheriff's uh, 
jail and court operations, about $362 million. That's about 39% of the countywide uh, uh, general fund. Other constitutionals, $148 million, that's 16%. So looking at the, the sum of the constitutionals, they are about 55% of the countywide general fund. Uh, after, after those, we have human services, uh, facilities management. We have tax increment financing. Uh, that's an important one in uh, uh, the countywide general fund. We have the tax increment districts that are associated with the uh, community redevelopment agencies. And that's where we pledge uh, a portion of the growth in our countywide property taxes uh, in support of those districts. And as uh, values rise in those districts, then the amount that uh, we're uh, committing uh, to fund those rises as well. Public works, about $46 million. Emergency management, $22 million, a very important uh, area that's been, of course, very active, as we all know, in the past few years. Uh, nonprofits, about $13 million. Medical examiner, $8 million, another countywide function. Then for the unincorporated area, uh, general fund. Uh, this fund funds services for unincorporated area residents of the county. These are services that typically uh, mirror those kinds of services that city residents uh, receive from their cities and pay through their city uh, millage assessments. The operating millage for the unincorporated area is 4.3745 mills which is about $875 on a home with an assessed value of $250,000. Uh, the unincorporated millage is lower than the three cities uh, millage. Uh, Tampa's is 6.2 and some change. Plant City millage is 5.7157 and Temple Terrace is 6.555. The services that uh, the unincorporated fund uh, um, supports Again, the sheriff, this one would be primarily patrol operations of the sheriff's law enforcement operations, fire rescue, parks and recreation, uh, some code enforcement, uh, certain uh, aspects of development services and public works. And the recommended budget, the unincorporated area general fund is about $684 million uh with reserves are about 117 million dollars looking at the bar graph the two largest uh areas that are funded by the unincorporated area fund are are uh, public uh, safety fire rescue uh, 233 million dollars that's about 41 percent of of services funded sheriff $177 million, that's about uh, 31%. So combined uh, for public safety, fire rescue and sheriff and the unincorporated fund, it's about 72% of the total uh, fund. It's also interesting that uh, that combined amount, $409 million, is in excess of the total amount of property tax that is uh, uh, in the unincorporated area fund, that's about $368 million. The other important areas that uh, fund the unincorporated fund are the state shared uh, sales tax that comes from the state 6% share uh, sales tax and also state revenue sharing. Uh, so those are critical to this fund. Uh, we have public works. Uh, a lot of their uh, maintenance types of activities are funded from uh, the unincorporated area general fund, uh, parks, $44 million, um, and then uh, some other smaller areas. Looking at changes in the two funds, first of all, taking a look at the countywide general fund, uh, we have about an increase of, of nearly $119 million in uh, revenues. Some of it is recurring revenue. Some of it is one-time revenue. And looking at uh, the changes uh, in expenditures or uses, we can see, again, where these cost pressures are uh, uh, coming up. Looking at constitutional officers and outside agencies, $39 million. Uh, 
it's not only the county, of course, that's experiencing difficulty in uh, recruiting and retaining employees. It's really any public or private employer currently. Uh, and this is primarily an increase uh, uh, from the sheriff's office. But it's important to note that the sheriff has been uh, uh, quite a good partner in, in, in many in the many recent years uh, lately in, in uh, uh, recognizing our budgetary uh, uh, constraints and uh, uh, being uh, moderate uh, in increases. But uh, the sheriff also is experiencing those types of recruiting and retaining issues and is uh, providing for uh, larger increases uh, to meet that challenge and and also some increases in non uniform uh, positions as well. There's also some uh, funding in in that area to support uh, the renovation of certain facilities for certain court functions. Employee compensation benefits uh, 19 and a half million dollars. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit more in a in a slide coming up what that entails. But again, that's to meet the the growing challenge in the labor market uh, to retain and recruit the employees that that really are the backbone of our service delivery. Uh, there are contract commitments and cost increases that departments uh, identify when they submit their budget requests. These are uh, can be field costs. It can be increases in in uh, contractual costs that they have every year. Uh, the technology category, the next one includes sometimes increases in, in licensing fees uh, for software and such. Uh, we also had funded some department requests, about four and a half million dollars. One area that uh, we did uh, fund when it came to enhanced levels of services was in the areas of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, to uh, uh, fund uh, that effort. Uh, the departments did re, uh, submit uh, large new requests uh, in this second year, but due to the fact that we had the cost pressures, we had to uh, uh, be selective in those areas that were funded. The tax increment districts that I mentioned earlier, uh, a $4.3 million increase, that's a larger increase than, than uh, we've had in recent years, but again, uh, that's due to the fact that uh, taxable values have increased uh, by a large amount. We also have funded uh, the land acquisition in order to fund a, a new county emergency and fire uh, rescue warehouse. And uh, that will show up in, in the construction uh, in the CIT. But as far as the land acquisition, we're sharing that between the two uh, general funds and apportioning it portioning it properly. Uh, that will uh, enhance uh, emergency management and fire rescue's ability to uh, have good uh, warehouse capacity and uh, access and, and logistical uh, control. Reserve maintenance, uh, $19.7 million. As Bonnie mentioned, we continue to maintain a strong uh, financial position uh, and uh, this is in in recognition of the board's policy to maintain 20 to 25 percent reserves between the two general funds. Uh, in the recommended budget, that left about 7.7 .7 million dollars available uh, for uh, uses that could be identified uh, through the summer, uh, otherwise known as flags. Uh, but also here we uh, recognize additional available that resulted from the July 1 taxable values that were higher than the June 1 estimates, and we have about another net $4.1 million available. So $11.8 .8 million available in the countywide general fund. Turning our attention again to the unincorporated area general fund and changes there, uh, the categories look very similar. Uh, the story is, is very similar. Uh, we have about $67 million increase in, in revenues, uh, one time and recurring. And again, we have a reflection of, of those same similar uh, cost uh, pressures and price pressures, employee compensation and benefits increased about uh, $23 million. Constitutional officers, 17 million. Uh, select department requests, uh, about $8 million. Again, we have the contract commitments and cost increases 
we have a uh, unincorporated share for the land acquisition for the new warehouse, uh, reserve maintenance uh, in the recommended budget that left about $2.6 million uh, that available that could be programmed over the summer. Reflecting the July 1 taxable values, we have about another 600,000. So the total available is about $3.2 million. Committee investment tax. Uh, this is a, a slide that we haven't uh, uh, seen in a number of years. The committee investment tax uh, does expire in Dece on December 1st, 2026. Uh, the CIT flow of revenue in, in, in the many recent years uh, was dedicated to the debt service, uh, to pay debt service on the CIT bonds that allowed a number of projects to be moved forward uh, during the uh, during the 2000s and 2010s. And we had expected in the later years of the CIT that there would be some pay-as-you-go dollars that would become available. That would be in excess of what is needed for debt service. And indeed, uh, we are starting to see that, about $54.6 million available uh, for programming in, in FY23. And uh, the use is in the recommended budget, the building or construction of the emergency fire, emergency and fire warehouse, $24 million. Uh, some parks and conservation maintenance items, $12 million. This often deals with uh, uh, access points, bridges, boardwalks, and some other items. Uh, some major maintenance in the jail, uh, this is some areas that uh, the sheriff uh, identified. Uh, the jail is uh, configured in, in pods where uh, jail inmates uh, are housed in a number of pods, about 20. Uh, and they're in now in need of uh, some major renovation. They're about two and a half, two and a half million dollars a piece to renovate. So this would uh, fund about four uh, renovations of pods, uh, and that would be something that would need to continue through the future as, as funding and uh, uh, materials are available. Bonnie mentioned that um, we uh, funded a new fire station, and the operating impact of the, of the new fire station is included in the unincorporated area general fund. And a portion of the construction, uh, two and a half million dollars, uh, would be funded from the committee investment tax. The balance would be funded from fire impact fees. Uh, we have two million dollars for the African American Cultural Center. That's for planning and design to be sure that we have sufficient funds to be able to complete that phase. Uh, all told, that leaves approximately three point three million dollars of uh, CIT funds that could be programmed uh, for FY23 or later years. So we're looking at uh, uh, various additions uh, to the general fund at public safety. Uh, countywide, we have some mosquito control equipment. We continue to uh, uh, pay attention to our disaster funding levels, uh, particularly in the light of recent uh, activity. And we, we, we make sure that those are, are well funded. We have that new Sun City North fire station and that staffing that I just talked about. Uh, upgrade of two rescue squads to rescue units for fire rescue that uh, allows for um, a higher level of service from those units. We have the increased funding for the sheriff in both funds and the purchase of the land for the emergency and fire warehouse. Looking at transportation and parks. Uh, in the unincorporated fund, there's funding to increase staffing at Branchton Park, at Kenley Rec Center, and Balm uh, Rec Center. Uh, some park site renovations, uh, the county roadway striping and pavement marking refurbishment program, and some pedestrian safety operations and uh, maintenance retrofits. Technology and facilities. Uh, we continue to uh, uh, maintain our facilities and keep pace with uh, changes in technology, uh, including um, 
our financial system and also the uh, programming in the, 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 the maintenance costs for new county facilities as they come online. And then investing in people and partners. Uh, I mentioned that we uh, funding for diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives. And in both funds, of course, uh, we, we recognize the importance of county staff and uh, uh, the challenges to recruit and, and maintain employees. We have in the budget uh, funding that would uh, accommodate compensation adjustments. Uh, during FY23, new wellness incentives that would expand wellness program, a paid time off program that would uh, be more flexible for employees, uh, that would be uh, one um, out of, of, of time off that's uh, more uh, flexible to manage uh, from an employee's perspective and from uh, HR perspective, an enhanced tuition reimbursement program that would expand uh, the funding towards that, but also expand elig eligibility and uh, requirements uh, for the tuition reimbursement program and expand the uh, purview of, of what could be uh, reimbursed. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this also uh, has increased funding requests for the constitutional officers and outside agencies that also reflect uh, higher personnel costs. Taking a look at general fund reserve analysis, uh, we mentioned earlier about uh, maintaining our financial stability. Uh, we uh, do have a, a AAA rating from all three credit agencies, and that uh, occurred uh, uh, about 11 years ago, 12 years ago. And it's important to note that we maintained uh, that AAA rating from all three agencies, even through uh, the COVID uh, pandemic and had them reaffirmed uh, by those agencies. And so that uh, they recognized that uh, we had uh, reserves and rainy day funds that helped us to um, uh, be resilient in, in times of financial uh, difficulty and that uh, we can uh, sustain that in, into the future. Uh, currently, in FY23, we had about 23% uh, reserves in the two general funds in the FY23 budget is about 24%. A 1% change in reserves is about $15.7 million. The countywide reserves are 26.5%. Unincorporated reserves are 20.6%. And again, that's reflective of the fact that, and we've been discussing this over a number of years, uh, the unincorporated area fund is, is our more uh, a stress fund when it comes to growth, when it comes to increasing in population and as service demands increase. And we, we're, uh, uh, that's where, you know, a lot of public safety is funded. And uh, uh, we, we have um, service deficiencies that we would like to deal with as well. And so the countywide reserves as a ratio do tend to be higher than the unincorporated area reserves, although it is uh, in the unincorporated area higher than 20% in the recommended budget this year. Uh, these are our general obligation CIT credit ratings. Uh, they are uh, healthy and, and we are maintaining them. Our enterprise fund as well. Uh, the enterprise funds do have a, a couple of AAA ratings as well, and these these are high. We we continue to uh, manage uh, the finances there and debt funds in a in a responsible manner. <clears throat> and the rating agencies have recognized that with uh, various comments that um, uh, we do uh, have a, a strong financial operating profile strong policies and practices. And also at, at the bottom, the ratings, these ratings also reflect that the county has a strong and diverse and expanding economy, which is also uh, important to these ratings. Our debt per resident is, is in the middle of the pack, about $1,000. Um, so we uh, maintain 
a moderate uh, level of death. Looking at the budget calendar, of course, today is budget delivery. Uh, July 28th will be the reconciliation public hearing. Uh, that's where statutorily uh, we need to adopt the initial uh, millage rates for the truth and millage process. And we adopt that so that the property appraiser can send out the trim notices in, in August. And, and that is uh, the millage rate that the board uh, will not be able to uh, uh, go over in, in, in the public hearings that occur in September, uh, where on September 15th, the board will adopt the tentative millage and budget and on September 26th, the process will conclude and the board will adopt uh, final millages and the final budget. Also on the 22nd, the board will adopt uh, the capital improvement program. So through uh, July 28th, uh, we'll be looking at the, the flagging process where we're gathering commissioner identified items for consideration at the reconciliation public hearing on the 28th. Uh, the board will have a uh, discussion, uh, uh, vote, simple majority. And as a reminder, countywide uh, available funds are $11.8 million. Unincorporated area of available funds are $3.2 million. And with that, I have concluded uh, my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. I may need help from uh, HTV to end my slideshow. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mr. Bricky. You have done an excellent job of going through a very complex budget. Uh, it is very difficult to try and discern the differences between our incorporated and unincorporated areas and the budgets associated with it and where those services lie. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to discussion and Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. And I just want to say this is one of the um, clearest, uh, crystal clear really, um, best uh, budget presentations that I've seen. This I think is, I was trying to figure it out, I think it might be my sixth year. <laughs> and I know that they're for to the first two or three years, um, I had um, a lot of issues um, in terms of really understanding the countywide versus the unincorporated county budgets, which, uh, you know, I know are very, very difficult for people to understand. And um, I think this, I think we really, with Mr. Bricky narr narrating, um, we should have a space for this on our website uh, if anybody wants a primer. Uh, about this year, just a, um, uh, a look, because I think it really helps to do that. I also, just to point out, um, I think I've got this right, uh, from a, a few things uh, that were presented up there that might be um, just just good to understand, um, is it, I think, it, uh, Mr. Bricky, did you say that the uh, for a $250,000 home, um, that the, the assessment is $1,146 uh, projected, I guess, at this time. County, was, countywide, just countywide. 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 Okay, I wasn't sure if that was, that's what I wanted to clarify. So I guess we'll see that in the, the future, uh, uh, a number that shows that um, Ms. Wise just, you might not have heard that, she just answered countywide. And that's what I wasn't sure of when I saw that. So I didn't want to misstate it. Um, and I don't think I saw a general number, but I didn't mean to cut you off, Mr. Berge. No, no, the, the uh, 1,146 would be the countywide portion. Uh, portion, and the unincorporated portion was 875. Okay, for great. Those two, for those two millages. And, and it might be good to have those just out there uh, overall as a combined figure to let um, people people know and see. Um, the other, I thought it was really important, and I don't think um, people understand and enough is made about this. I, as Ms. Wise knows, call the unincorporated area, the um, the city of Hillsborough County, <laughs> uh, because it just, it, I mean, we only have three other jurisdictions here, and it's by far the largest one. We have more than a million people 
living in unincorporated. It's one of the largest, as I understand, unincorporated areas in the nation. So it's quite a job managing it, and that's, um, you know, we, we do, as a county commission, services for all that. And I think it's very important to point out with these two budgets, we have one that's that's doing okay here, the uh, countywide uh, budget that covers all these countywide services that were so well put out there by Mr. Bricky, um, the uh, offices, the jails and courts, the um, constitutional offices, the uh, services, economic development, um, human services. Um, but we also have the regular city services for the city of unincorporated Hillsborough County. And I'd just like to point out and uh, that our millage is, I just consider it, and I thought from the time I started here, that it was kind of crazy. For this unincorporated city, we have a millage of 4.37, almost 4.4 for that. Whereas the city of Tampa has 6.2 mills, Plant City has 5.7 mills, and Temple Terrace has 6.5 mills for the same, to cover the same kinds of operations. And this budget, the unincorporated county budget, is desperate. It's desperately stressed. It's one of the reasons I was so um, strong about and insistent about um, raising our impact fees, and uh, as well for the billions, literally, of dollars that we missed in infrastructure support over the years. Um, in the last decade or two decades, it was uh, truly unbelievable. Um, but um, we've, as well, um, I think it's just got to be clear that I, I just don't even see how we operate uh, with what we do. And now we have these new stresses on our economy that are coming. And, and despite the increases in the value of our homes, we have Save Our Homes at limits uh, for homeowners that are residents here with the homestead that limits it to 3%. Uh, increases, but when there's a drop, like there has been in the decade before, it was a precipitous drop, huge drop, and it took years and years and years to make that value up. Um, and yet we still, whenever we have a drop, we it, the whole drop gets counted, but we can only increase after that and climb back at the rate of 3% a year. So that's a, that's a huge amount of um, income that we uh, lost over the years uh, as we try to uh, you know, make that up. Um, and right now, we're facing all the inflationary pressures that everyone else is facing. I think it, uh, uh, you know, we have to understand the uh, job, uh, the employment issues that we have as we're competitive with our jobs, or try to be, <laughs> nationally. Um, in um, some cases, and, and locally in many, and we're um, uh, faltering there, as uh, I've been told many times, we're having difficulty and have very many open positions in recruitment, so we'll um, have to be looking at that. So we have the regular inflation pressures, we have the employment pressures, and we have the years and years of um, difficult um, times that we've had, and we have our low millage rate. So I, that's all I'd just like to put out there, but I appreciate the budget presentation as it was done, and I really think we should make this available um, someplace because uh, it, it, because I think it would be a really, to the extent that people could absorb it, it would be very, very helpful for um, them to know. And I, I'll say, too, I'm, um, for the most part, pretty much... Uh, feel very good about the kinds of investments we've made in this county um, for, for the last uh, several years in terms of all the uh, infrastructure, the um, human resources and human capital, uh, the getting our employees up to $15 an hour um, prior to, to any of this happening. Um, I just think we've, we've done um, a good job, and as, as you can see, too, the uh, ratings for our reserves are are there as well. So um, it's it's been good work, and I um, I, I want to note that because it's it's um, been great management of the resources that we have that are um, not as um, uh, <laughs> not as uh, large, not as uh, there just to be wasted. It's been um, I think 
pretty much carefully managed with good investments, and I think we're um, moving, keep moving in that direction. Thank you, Commissioner Kemp. I have similar similar um, opinions on on where we are. I'm very proud of uh, the work that's being done by the staff, by the, our county administrator and team, um, at really looking at how we how we spend our dollars. With that, I'll recognize Commissioner Smith. And uh, thank you, Commissioner Kemp, for um, that you know really important clarification of uh, some of those points in the budget to to make sure people understand. I agree; it'd be great to have this presentation online for people. Um, and and I just want to say I think our county is doing an excellent job, Ms. Wise. You are really doing a great job, and and the whole staff of understanding the priorities that are important to our community in spending these dollars. Um, and so we are really d being able to do good work with, uh, uh, with our, within our budget as best we can in prioritizing uh, transportation and infrastructure improvements as best we can, affordable housing, social, social services uh, that people are, are really crying out for at every uh, town hall meeting, every group we speak to. I think um, this is a really responsive budget uh, uh, by a very, uh, by an administration that is really listening to what the, what the community needs are and doing our best to um, prioritize the tax dollars uh, it, with that direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. And I, I, too, wanted to just point out, and what has really been a great presentation where you point out the differences between uh, the incorporated and the unincorporated budgets. Uh, it is, it, it's about a 1.3%, I mean, 1.3 1, 1 mil difference between um, our countywide dollars and our unincorporated dollars. When you have that kind of difference, you're not going to have urbanized services that many people in our unincorporated county would like to see and want. Um, so there's, you know, we want to make sure we have enough sheriffs. We want to make sure we have fire rescue being able to show up at your doorstep, and we have roads that we can, we can repave and resurface. We have parks that people can enjoy. We have code enforcement that can follow up when there's a violation that causes either a health or a community hazard. And then we have the ability to have development services really work through helping us deal with the in increase in population that's coming here and how to manage that growth. Those are all services that are in the unincorporated part of our budget that are critical to the success of this county. And when your outgo exceeds your income, our upkeep will be our downfall, and that is critically important to recognize when we are developing budgets for how we successfully address the fact that everybody in the world wants to live in the Tampa Bay region right now, including Hillsborough County, and we have to plan accordingly to make sure that we're continuing to provide the services that are our, our residents not only deserve but expect. Um, so I, I just want to say thank you to the staff for making it more clear and I look forward to the discussions on how we uh, invest the future if, for um, what each of the commissioners would like to see as a priority with the reserves that are there or the flag items that could potentially be there. Um, and that's, I think, an important process to recognize, too. That's, uh, those are one-time types of projects or projects that we would, we would ask um, the board to consider for the dollars that are there. But I did want to point out something that's in the presentation that I think is important. Mr. Bricky made mention of our reserves and how we are using those to not only prepare for the future, but also to recognize that our ratings are so very important. And during the periods where we were impacted by COVID, where sales tax went down, where other fees uh, went down, our economy took a, a hit, a real hit. Um, our reserves um, fell about $30 million, if I'm looking at the round numbers. Because we had those reserves, we were able to use those dollars to make up for the cash flow changes that occurred during those time periods. That's why we have them. Um, and as a consequence of that, those ratings are actually solid. And we're able to borrow money to invest in our communities 
at the most preferable rates, which is helping us invest in our future for our county. So I just want to say thank you so much and look forward to the reconciliation budget next Thursday. We'll have an opportunity to take a look at the fine tune now that we've seen the budget numbers. And with that, I'll take a motion to receive the report. So moved. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Commissioner Cohen. I Commissioner Overman, I apologize. I put my hand up after you had started speaking. And um, the, the only thing I wanted to add to all of the excellent points that have been made um, is that there is a real emphasis in this budget on public safety. There, it, when you look at the amount of money that is being spent on the sheriff, on Hillsborough County Fire Rescue, on the ancillary services that we provide for the courts, what you can see is that the value of keeping our citizens safe is first and foremost uh, in all of our minds. And I think that this is an expression of that. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really very complimentary of uh, the staff for, for putting that first and foremost uh, in, in terms of, of where we're putting our emphasis. Excellent. So moved. Just second. We have a motion by Commissioner Kemp, second by Commissioner Myers. Seeing no further comments, uh, please take a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move on to our special appearance. Ms. Yes. Wise. Yes. And thank you all for those comments. And a big thanks to Kevin Bricky and to Tom Festor, of course, and all the directors. I appreciate all that. Um, is our special appearance by Bob Enriquez, our Hillsborough County property appraiser. It'll go into a little bit more detail about what's happening in the real estate market. This is item E1. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Oh, we can't hear you, sir. Bob, you are currently muted. All right, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Good. First of all, happy birthday. Thank you. Um, I, I, it's funny, I, I knew that it was, then I saw the sign in the back of your chair. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank Mr. Bricky for making my presentation so we can all go to lunch. Um, <laughs> hey, Bob, <laughs> can you get a little bit closer to your mic? That's... I'll get closer. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Is that better? better. That's better. Much better? OK. Um, well, I'll try to go through. A lot of this, uh, Mr. Bricky has touched on, so I will try to be um, as pithy as possible. Um, and I, I know that, uh, uh, first of all, I, I appreciate the opportunity to make this presentation today. It's something I have not done in the past, but you know, given what, what we've been talking about this morning um, and the unique, uh, extraordinary uh, year that we're in, or years that we are in, um, I thought that it was important to do this this year. Um, so let me uh, go ahead and share. Let me know if you can see my presentation here. It's coming up. It's working? Okay. There we go. Okay. There you go. We can see it. All right. There's there's me. Never. I'll never look that good again. Um, well, as you know, uh, the, the Hillsborough County real estate market is in, incredibly healthy. Um, and really, year over year, since 2013, as we came out of the Great Recession, we have seen on any given year anywhere from 6.5% to 10% overall increase in, um, in, in overall property value in Hillsborough County. Um, to give you an idea of, of how extraordinary this year, it, it, it's more on the order of 23 to 24% overall increase in property value um, as of January 1st of 2022 from the previous year. Um, that's, that's a remarkable increase. Um, and, um, you know, something that I don't think that anybody's ever seen something quite like that here. Um, you know, sales prices, building permit activity, as you know, transactions of all types have continued to, to increase this year and, and, and into the first quarter of, of uh, 22 as well. You've kind of gone through this with Mr. Bricky, so I won't, I won't touch on it that much. You understand that, that our job as a property appraiser, my job constitutionally is to determine the value of all the property in Hillsborough County and evaluate exemption applications for folks that, that apply for the various exemptions that to add to lower taxes. 
we report that information to you guys that uh, we've reported. That's how you started this process, budget process, based on the desired revenue that you need for your budget, the one that you just talked about. Uh, again, always remember that those values are based on January 1st of a given year. So when in August, which is the next thing that, that will take place after you guys finish up uh, going through your budget process and giving us the information back to us, uh, when we send out the trim notice or the notice of proposed taxes, it's based, the value is based on January 1st, 2022. So clearly the market changes in that, that interim period. Um, at that point, there's a 25 day period. Uh, that's an important per period of time, which taxpayers can uh, appeal to the value adjustment board. Of course, you have a couple of members there that are on the value adjustment board. Um, if they disagree with the value or an exemption denial that maybe it shows up on their trim notice, um, that's from the date of, of mailing that they have those 25 days that goes through sometime in September. And then, of course, we start the value adjustment board process that goes on uh, depending on how many we have. And we would expect this year would be a little bit more than normal, given the increases. Tax bills go out um, in November and the payments are due by March 30th. And then you, hopefully all the revenue comes back and you guys can do all the things that you want to do. I'm going to kind of just go through historically kind of uh, some idea to give you an idea of what we've seen really prior to the uh, Great Recession and then um, where we are today. If you look at the residential real estate market, um, you're going to see that we've that we've had obviously increases since 2013, as I, as I stated, and then you'll see this precipitous rise, precipitous rise um, as of January 1st, 2022 in that in that bar of 21. What I think is important, and, and um, the chair chair uh, person just spoke to this, that if you kind of look at the trends after, uh, and again, and again, this has to do with cap properties and exemptions and a lot of other reasons. As you look prior to uh, the Great Recession and we, where we were in terms of gross sales or or uh, in price, price per square foot, we really didn't get back to those similar numbers until 2018 or 2019. And then, of course, we we went through the pandemic, so we saw, uh, you know, we saw a little bit of a, uh, a different market during that time. But again, it takes a while to catch up, even though we have when a downturn happens, it, 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 it really happens, but it takes a while to catch up after the fact. Similar in the commercial real estate, and let me go back for just one second, just to give you an idea this year between uh, uh, January 1st, 2021 and January 1st, 2022. We saw a 31% increase in overall um, gross sales in Hillsborough County, um, and then a 27% in per square foot, uh, the, the cost per square foot. Um, so again, significant historic rise uh, uh, um, uh, or increases. Commercially, um, you know, and this is you're going to see a little bit more. This is less. You're going to see a little more upturn and downturn for commercial uh, kind of the markets. Uh, React differently to upturns and downturns, and and, the, and obviously we saw the, the downturn during the the, the pandemic. Um, but again, in this case, you're going to see that where it, how long it took us to get back to, and it was a little bit quicker in terms of uh, gross sales of per square foot. But again, it lagged behind the re, the, the re, you know the recovery is much slower than the downturn uh, during the recession, and you're going to see now that this year, in terms of commercial. Um, and I won't I really quote the overall sales because there was a downturn in overall sales during the pandemic, particularly in commercial. But really, as far as, as, far as per square foot increase, it was similar. It was 27% increase, similar to residential um, this year. This kind of just tracks the same thing uh, in terms of just value over time. And, and Mr. Berkey had a similar uh, slide, so I won't really touch on it. He also had the, the revenues over time. Um, going forward, All right, let's kind of get into the the meat and potatoes, and and this has all of the the, the, ta the various taxing authorities or the municipalities as well. Um, and you, but you you can see that uh, just a market value uh, for uh, 2021 was about 172 uh, billion dollars. Uh, that is, is has increased this year to 221, almost 222 uh, billion. The taxable value, once you back out uh, exemptions and what have you, um, then you'll see that the, that you have about 130 uh, uh, billion of taxable value this year. Again, that increase you're going to see is between 15 and 16 percent, as Mr. Berkey spoke to, 
for general revenue and for county MSTU. Um, just for, for comparison, uh, you can see obviously that the county, uh, the, the school system, uh, in certain cases, they're local. Um, they're some of the, the they're exempt from uh, uh, certain certain uh, things, so that theirs is a little bit of ta their taxable value doesn't go down quite as quickly. Um, and, but if you see the similar numbers, really for each of the municipalities, I will point out the Temple Terrace. Uh, their taxable value went up a little bit more because they had an uh, Amazon facility come on board this year. And again, here it just kind of breaks out. You can see the difference um, in terms of taxable uh, values this year, uh, 12 to 13% for general revenue and um, county MSTU. What does that mean in the final analysis? Well, last year, 2021, you collected on the order of $699 um, million dollars, um, in, in revenue. And this year that would increase in terms of general revenue to 806, about a, get a 15% increase. Um, you know, about the, in MSTU, it was about 321 and a half, uh, million, and that will, would increase this year, given the same unchanged millage rate that you're talking about to 367, almost 368 uh, million dollars. So that's that's about a hundred on in general revenue about 107 and a half million dollar increase, and MSTU about uh, 46 and a half million dollars increase give or take. And that's including new construction as well. Now I wanted to do just to kind of personalize this presentation uh, really quickly, um, and because when there are questions will be asked, and I'm sure there will be of our office and of each of you personally um, as we go forward. Remember that we have the save our homes cap that uh, Commissioner Kemp spoke to. Uh, and in those cases, uh, the homestead of properties that are capped from year to year, they, they, they can only, uh, their taxable value can't go up more than 3% or inflation. Remember that inflation really since 2008 has been less than 3%. This year, obviously we know that uh, inflation has gone up, uh, there's been a precipitous rise. So uh, homestead of properties will see for the most part a 3% increase in taxable value. Um, you know, depending on the size of the home, that's, that's, it's an increase and with everything else, it's still, um, you know, it's a hit, but it's only 3%. Really the folks that are gonna see in the residential scenario, that are gonna see the, uh, the significant increases are gonna be those folks that are um, non-homesteaded property that purchased in the last uh, year, 21. And obviously if you're in new construction, then you're gonna feel the full the full amount um, of the increase. Um, and to give you an idea of what that would be, more or less, for a residential property, let's say if you if the sale price and the, and the median sale price in 2022 is somewhere in the order of $385,000, um, let's say if you if you had a, a, a the previous owner uh, was capped back in 2020, uh, back in 2012, okay, so they're, they're, they're over the course of time, they've been capped, their increase has been less than 3% during that time. They, they've abandoned their home center, they've sold their home. Um, the new own, the previous owner would probably be paying in the, in somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,300 in property taxes in any given year. Um, so in 2021, they would have paid somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,300. The new owner this year, now that the cap comes off, the cap resets, um, based on no millage rate uh, increase or change um, this year, would pay somewhere in the order of $6,900. Um, so that's $4,600 more or less um, increase in, their, in the tax bill for the new owner this year. Um, that's you know, a remarkable increase. And obviously it's gonna, it's gonna raise questions from folks that bought in 2021. Uh, we get a lot of those calls and they, they, they forget that for the remainder of 2021, if they moved in sometime in 2021, they were really paying the previous owners uh, taxes. And then when the cap resets next year, um, and they're in, in, as in most cases, this, the, there's an escrow analysis done by their, their mortgage company and they're gonna get a little bit of a shock. Those are the folks that are really gonna see the, the major increases this year um, because of those new owners that bought in 2021. Similar in, in terms of commercial properties, you know, commercial property is capped. There's a 10% uh, cap on uh, commercial or non-residential properties. Um, so, you know, year over year, they may have seen a 10% increase um, or less 
um, in any given year. Uh, again, most for the most part, up until the last, uh, you know, till this last year, in most cases, commercial properties didn't see over a ten percent increase, and then in some cases they may have. But again, it's been capped, so the the uh, effect to the to a long term owner would they wouldn't have necessarily felt as much this year. And we've had in all cases over seventy thousand transactions of one type or another in Hillsborough County, um, and many of those obviously are commercial. In those cases, again. So if you had a, ca a case where somebody's been capped on the property for say since, since say uh, 2012, they've been capped. They sell the property. The cap resets. The the new owner, the old owner, may have been paying somewhere in the neighborhood of, let's say, in the typical uh, case of a of a uh, of a warehouse, maybe they were they may have been paying the order of, of fifteen thousand dollars a year in, in taxes. Um, the new owner would pay somewhere in the neighborhood of 23,000 um, under the, the, and again, these are just sort of scenarios, uh, you know, they, they it, it can vary from one to another, but again, those ad valorem tax, uh, those new owners are going to pay a significant amount if they, if they purchased in 2021, when the cap resets for commercial properties as well, and non-residential property or non, uh, non-homesteaded properties. So where do we see that, that, what, you know, where do we see that? Obviously, in most of these cases, they're leasing property. Uh, there may be investors. They're passing those increases on, and that's why you're seeing rental rates, particularly in, in uh, non-homesteaded properties. Um, you see the rental rates that are going up for, for rental properties and what have you as well as these these owners pass through uh, these increases to their to their tenants. And that's it. And I'll take any questions that you may have. I appreciate this opportunity, and I, and again, our office is always available to you. Uh, to answer any questions that you may have uh, going forward and uh, I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you very, very much for that presentation. That was very thorough. Helped us understand where where the triggers are. Um, with that, I just I wanted to point out that um, it's my understanding that about 50% of our residential properties are actually homesteaded, although I'd, I'd love to get a better number on that. Um, so those properties that are not homesteaded, that are either, um, you know, mom and pop owned or whether or not they are uh, institutional owned, um, don't have that cap. And that adds to our tax revenue, but that ultimately passes on to our rental rates. So as a policy and looking at how the county invests in helping the home ownership, there's an opportunity to save not only us, but also it does impact our, our overall revenues. But I do see that that's a lever that we we could look, look at investing in. And um, this, it does ebb and flow. You know, we saw where it, it did go down. I do not anticipate seeing the same kind of response we saw back in 2005, 6, 7, and 8, 9, largely due to the uh, population growth that we're seeing that's going to continue to stabilize and buoy the, the increase in in values and demand in properties. But um, with that, we can uh, receive the report. If I have a motion. I'll move approval. Excellent. Second. Second by Commissioner Kemp, a second by Commissioner Myers to receive your report. And thank you very much, sir. So that, take a roll call vote. <clears throat> Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, I think we only have one more item, but that was for time served and at one thirty. Yes, but she is available. And if you could just waive your rules, you can hear that earlier. Uh, Peggy is prepared. And then move to waive the rules. Oh, okay. Second. Well, second. Oh, and I'll jump at once. Okay. <laughs> we have a motion and a second to waive the rules to move the one thirty hearing to 12 10 or 12. And uh, with that, is, we'll have to take a quick roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagan? Yes. Hemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Excellent. Ms. Wise. Wonderful. That is item B1. This is to accept the county internal auditor's external quality assessment report. And Ms. Kasky is available to present this item. Ms. Caskey, you're recognized, and I, the total geek in me is going to go, oh, my God, this is the best report, so we didn't want to miss it. No, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
I'm going to go ahead and go decide. Ahead. Hopefully everybody else thinks this is exciting. <laughs> so can you see my screen? Yes, we can. You may proceed. All right. All right. So um, good morning, commissioners. My name is Peggy Caskey for the record. And I'm here today to present the external quality assessment summary of results. Um, so you may be asking why should conformance with international professional standards matter to the board? Um, in today's business environment, having an efficient, effective internal audit function is a true necessity. Uh, because internal audit is vital to good corporate health, um, an essential board responsibility is to ensure that the internal auditors do it well. So, but how can the board make sure the internal audit serves the organization effectively? Um, the answer lies with the international standards for the professional practice of internal auditing, uh, which you often hear uh, referred to as Red Book standards. Um, the standards also provide a framework for a variety of audit services, um, delineates the basic principles, um, establishes the basis, the basis for evaluation of internal audit performance, and fosters a improved organizational processes and operations. So how does internal audit support and enhance um, organizational processes and operations? Um, the, county, the county garnishes inspiration from audit recommendations that outline and steer the strategic direction of key projects. Internal audit had a behind the scenes role and early involvement in ensuring well-designed business processes, successful implementation of new technologies, um, strong controls, reliable financial records, and strong leadership. Um, since results can take months or even years to reach full fruition, um, it is difficult to draw a straight dotted line from a business process that we had um, audited to um, management recognition successes and accomplishments. But I'm providing a few examples here. Um, internal audit performed projects in economic development, fleet management, and pet resources. And then within months or years later, these three areas received national recognitions and awards. Um, there was also a large increase in um, not only lives saved for the pets in Hillsborough County, um, but also saving animals from abusive homes. Um, business, we also business partnered with the county attorney a few years back, which resulted in collecting nearly $100,000 in a refund. Uh, we assisted the Environmental Lands Program, um, known as ELAP, um, and that resulted in reoccurring savings of about $50,000 annually, um, as well as the board had made available about $67.5 million for land acquisition. Um, we identified opportunities to mature technology and cybersecurity operations. Um, we facilitated and coordinated um, costs, cost of service studies, which resulted in um, 1.7 million in annual cert, annual savings, uh, where costs had exceeded the fees. Um, and then lastly, um, we also provided some advice and recommendations to modernize the vertical process in the building division. Um, and that resulted in many enhancements to the program for the citizens of Hillsborough County. So I, I think you can see here that our office does um, provide value to the organization. Um, as a background, um, the Red Book standards require that the internal audit um, shop um, be audited about every five years. So yes, auditors do get audited. We get, we get that question all the time. Um, I had opted for a full scope external quality assessment, um, which was the most comprehensive approach that's available. Um, the EQA was performed by the Institute of Internal Auditors Quality Assurance LLC, um, and the results are going to be presented in the following slides. So the objectives um, were not only to um, test to see if my office conforms with the Red Book standards, but also the other objectives was conformance with the code of ethics, um, internal audits effectiveness, providing assurance and advisor service, and then also identifying opportunities where we could further mature our operations. Uh, and this is very similar to what we do for other um, areas underneath the Board of County Commissioners when we audit. 
So the audit approach, um, they reviewed the internal audits, business processes, policies, procedures, um, working papers, as well as com comparing those to the final communication results, um, reports, um, conducted interviews and surveys, and then they benchmarked my office's activities against national data and standards. Um, the scope of work included an evaluation of, of our efficiency effectiveness in executing its mission as set forth within the charter. So the summary of results, um, internal audit generally conforms to the audit standards and generally conforms to the highest uh, rating that we could get. Um, there were no conformance gaps identified and only 10% of the audit shops reached this level of conformity. So we were very happy with these results. Um, the audit team also had recognized my shop for other leading practices um, such as maturity and policies, procedures, and business processes, um, the risk assessment and engagement planning techniques and process that we perform annually, um, and then also our leverage for um, the use of technology and, and using subject matter expertise. And I think the board um, knows, um, but the public may not, that we have switched from um, looking at um, smaller samples, and now we actually test full populations of data. Okay, so now that we've talked about the standards and um, quality of services related to code ethics, what do the stakeholders think of our of the um, their experience with our office? Um, they've expressed, uh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong slide here. Um, we have actually exceeded the quality assurance historical national average in all 23 areas in the Ford standards and domains. So again, um, we're exceeding. Um, and then in here, um, we felt we had gotten um, some feedback um, that our stakeholders have said about us that um, we're organized and ethical, um, extremely knowledgeable. We have a high level of competence, um, not behold managed, but rather complimentary, which um, shows all of that effort we've been putting towards being a good business partner. Um, efforts that have saved about 100,000 animals uh, in our animal resources area. Um, high integrity, great communications, um, could provide additional benefit if we had a higher staffing level. And they also um, commented that we should be more specific when we're pr making presentations to the um, County Internal Audit Committee and um, Based on that comment, we have added additional slides and information in our presentations. Um, so the, um, the audit team had identified two areas where we could mature operations under the Board of County Commissioners. Um, one of these is under the County Administrator, and then the other one is going to fall under Internal Audit. Um, the one under the County Administrator, this is kind of organization-wide. Um, and what they recognized um, this year was the organization doesn't have an enterprise risk management process. Um, and what it, what's happening is there's a lot of reliance um, on the internal audit assessment that we perform every year. And then also those discussions that we're having with the risk environment group. Um, so what I did was I took this recommendation to the risk environment group and we had a pretty good discussion on this. Um, and we're still going to have to do a little bit more research of exactly how to implement an ERM and then what would those benefits be to the county because we run over a lot of good program. Um, but the risk, but um, during that meeting, the um, risk department director showed a lot of interest in implementing this. Um, so we're going to pursue that as a risk environment group. And then my office will um, support whatever efforts that, that are needed. Um, the second, the second improvement area um, falls under basically under my office, but again, it is an organization-wide improvement. Um, and this one here uh, is that the organization doesn't have an assurance map um, that supports the annual risk assessment performed by my office. Um, but like I said, it could support the ERM process when that is also implemented. So this one's actually a really good implement, um, recommendation. I'm, gonna, I'm really excited to do this. Um, but we did talk about this in the, in the last risk environment group meeting. 
Um, and we are going to be creating an assurance map. Uh, my office is going to take the lead on that, but the envi risk environment group is going to fully support this. Um, and it's my desire to create this in the fall and then hopefully in time to utilize this um, when I do the annual risk assessment planning for 2023. Um, but it is a very large undertaking, and I really don't know if I'm going to be able to reach that goal, uh, but definitely it will be com completed in the early part of next year if we can't do it this year. Um, and that's pretty much my presentation. Um, in the um, agenda item, I do have the full reports from the um, Institute of Internal Auditors, and um, you can read that yourself. Um, but it is about a 30-page report, and it's kind of a little funky the way that it's written. I just thought this might be a better presentation. So I open for any comments or questions that you all may have. Thank you, Ms. Kasky. I truly appreciate that. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. I just want to thank uh, Ms. Kasky for her always excellent work. It's really good to see um, the whole presentation, and I, I enjoyed seeing everything from the um, assessments of our ELAP, um, our fleet management, and I particularly enjoyed seeing that we are now getting $2 million or more in, in uh, fees for um, on our land user applications, which were, hadn't been raised in 30 years. So um, that, was, uh, that, was, that was good to see. Very much appreciate everything, uh, the work you do, and uh, have a great uh, confidence in that. So, uh, so thank you very much, and um, that's, that's all I have to say, but thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Smith? Yes, I just want to say um, I think we're very, very fortunate to have an internal auditor as um, you know, as, as detail oriented and as um, uh, effective uh, as Ms. Kasky. Um, it is just so important to keep taking stock, to keep taking inventory, keep looking for where you can um, be a little, have a little bit of an improvement or a lot of improvement, and where. Um, uh, some opportunities are, and um, I, I just can't imagine this uh, job being done any better by anyone else but uh, Ms. Kasky. So thank you very much for the um, always uh, hard work that you do to to dot every I, cross every T, and make sure we're um, we're getting our money's worth and we're doing the best job we possibly can in this county. And I'll move approval. Okay, we have a motion for approval, a second by Commissioner Myers. A uh, motion by Commissioner <laughs> Kemp, a, a second by Commissioner Myers. Um, and I would, I'd like to echo those comments. I will, I will say to this, this issue, you know, one, the county has an internal auditor. Not only provides advice on making sure that all the numbers are right, but also examining and providing an advisory role to those departments to allow processing to be done and to look at where bureaucracy can become haphazard or problematic and giving the, our staff the support they need to be successful to deliver services to our, our residents and our citizens in the community. But more importantly, when we have an outside auditor that comes in and, and basically says, you're doing it right. Not only are you doing it right, but you're doing it well. <laughs> Um, should give our residents, our taxpayers, confidence that we're getting it right. So again, another evidence, today must be good government day, another piece of evidence that shows that we are being very good stewards of our resources, and not only the dollars, but the, but the manpower and the resources that uh, this county provides to its citizens. And I'm very, very proud to receive this report. So thank you very, very much for, for that presentation. Another evidence of good government in our area. And with that, we'll do a roll call vote. Overman? Yes. Cohen? Yes. Hagen? Hagen? Kemp? Yes. Myers? Yes. Smith? Yes. White? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Excellent. Thank you very much. Ms. Wise? We are now on to future discussion items. Wonderful. <laughs> um, do we have any future uh, items? I see Commissioner White, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have uh, two items. Um, one involves um, 
Uh, the fact that there may be some air condition work that's necessary at the Regent, which I believe is owned by HCC, but um, but they have some sort of an agreement with the Regent board that originally got the project for um, building the facility off the ground. And there's evidently some sort of a dispute as to which group is on the hook for the air conditioning work. Uh, the reason I'm bringing this to the Board of County Commissioners is because uh, when they built the Regent, they did receive state funding that allowed them to harden the facility as a hurricane shelter. And it is um, an alternate special needs shelter for the county. And an MOU with HCC was approved as such um, as an item labeled as B5 um, in the April 3rd, 2013 board meeting. So that is an alternate special needs shelter. As such, I believe that um, someone, um, either HCC or the Regent Board, um, has an obligation to keep the facility in good working order should we need to activate it as a hurricane shelter. So I'm not asking the county to fund the air conditioning work, and I'm not asking the, the county to attempt to use any police powers that we don't have but I would like to ask if someone on our staff can sit down with, I would start with the owner, which I believe is HCC. I guess we'll have to research that and make sure that they actually um, are the owner, but sit down with HCC and just get an idea of what the plan is to address that air conditioning work and make sure they understand that it's imperative that the facility be kept in good working condition should we need to activate it as a shelter. The second item has to do with uh, Tampa Bay Water's new booster project, and they're going to need to run lines, you know, ultimately to the South County area to uh, boost pressures. Um, there's either an active um, public engagement period right now, or it's recently closed. If it's closed, it's been probably in the past few days. But it's my understanding that. Our ELAP staff has expressed to Tampa Bay Water that they potentially have uh, some efficient routes available through ELAP properties, and that would have the blessing of our ELAP staff. It would not go through any ecologically pristine land. It would go through ELAP uh, preserve parking lots, trail systems, things like that. My understanding is that this route is potentially uh, more efficient and could potentially save dollars um, in terms of less land acquisition uh, being necessary. But there's conflicting evidence in the community as to whether or not uh, Tampa Bay water staff is in receipt of the uh, offer, if you will, by our ELAP staff that they can use that property. So I would like to, again, and I see some level of interest from our Tampa Bay water representatives, but I'd like to see if someone on our staff can sit down with Tampa Bay water staff and at least make sure that they are aware that that offer is on the table. So I guess going back to the region issue, um, I, I would ask staff there to just send a memo to the board, perhaps, that describes your findings. Uh, but if it's okay with our Tampa Bay Water representatives on the county commission, a report to the BOCC might be in order that would describe the public engagement process that's been going on and um, what the plans are with respect to the routing of those lines. That might take some time uh, to develop, but, uh, but that might be in order for that one. Commissioner Cohen, you're recognized. And I can see Commissioner Smith uh, shaking her head. We will, we will definitely pursue that with Tampa Bay Water and make sure that uh, they come back to us with that information. I had a very brief item, uh, and that uh, relates to uh, towing rates. Uh, towing rates have been the same since 2009. A lot of the towing companies are under some inflationary pressures, just like the rest of us are. And um, it used to be that towing rates were set by the Public Transportation Commission. But since that doesn't exist anymore, it might fall to us to make those determinations. So I'm just going to ask the county administrator to look into that and report back to us uh, about that. 
Thanks. Excellent, excellent. I'd also like to get um, an analysis of our uh, of to, uh, in looking at towing to also look at uh, the response or, or complaints in the towing industry because they're while the rates may be low, um, the cost to some citizens is significant, including their vehicle. <laughs> Once it's towed and, and not retrieved, um, should they not be able to do so in that time period? So I'd like to see those practices looked at. Commissioner Kim. I as well think that it's time for that. Since I've been on the commission, um, we had a quite debated, because that's when the, the, the end of the Public Transportation Commission happened. And there was quite strong su support um, by staff and re with recommendations, as well as one of uh, the towing companies that came forward and said that, um, I think it was that some of the companies were forcing people to pay in cash, which was a huge burden and a danger in some cases. And, um, and there was lots of support for that, and yet, I, in the end, I think I was the only person in other companies saying that they can definitely handle with credit card and that, you know, yeah. I was the only, uh, I think, vote to ha make that happen at the time. Um, and I, I like it to be brought back again because I thought it was not, um, you know, good public policy. And so I think that that maybe could be I'm added I'm glad you mentioned time. that. I actually mentioned that to Mr. Horwadell when we talked about this. I had heard through another source that people were not allowed to pay with credit cards. And I agree with you. That, that really needs to be fixed. Because people, if they can't pay cash or don't have the cash available, their car is going to not be available to them. So uh, we can look at all those things at once and uh, in the future at some point. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, any others? I don't have one today. I'm sure I will next week. But <laughs> no, thank you very much. Thank you all very much for being here today. And, and we are adjourned.